offer, I now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Richard Lockhead on the Common Agriculture Policy Budget Allocation. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Cabinet Secretary, you have ten minutes. I am grateful for this opportunity to update Parliament on developments relating to farm payments and rural development funding from 2014, following the UK Government's announcement on 8 November on the Common Agricultural Policy Budget Allocations for the devolved administrations. As I know the Chamber appreciates, Scottish farming is deeply dependent on European payments to help our farmers compete and remain viable, to support a rural economy and, of course, to put food on their tables and care for Scotland's environment. The CAP budgets also support wider rural development and environment schemes, the length and breadth of Scotland. Earlier this year, the EU set its seven-year budget framework for 2014 to 2020. This included member states' allocations under the CAP's direct farm payments, known as Pillar 1, and rural development payments, known as Pillar 2. At the time, the Scottish Government was deeply disappointed with the deal negotiated with the UK, given Scotland's demand for a fairer share of the EU budgets. However, since we have known the wider CAP budget at EU and UK level, all that has remained was the UK Government to announce the internal UK split of that budget. On Pillar 1, Europe adopted a formula called external convergence. This increased the payments per hectare for all Member States below a threshold set at 90% of EU average. In addition, Europe said no Member State, no Member State should end up with an average of less than €196 Euros per hectare. Therefore, had Scotland been a member state, Scottish farmers and crofters would have received the full benefit of external convergence, an extra €1 billion, Euros, that's £850 million, pounds, over the seven years, because our average per hectare is well below those thresholds. As part of the UK, Scotland's low average is offset by the averages of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. As a result, the UK as a whole received what can now be confirmed as only €223 million Euros from external convergence, around £190 million. Pounds. However, despite our historically low share of funding, there was a chink of hope, of course, for Scotland. England, Wales and Northern Ireland all have payments uh, at levels above the EU's thresholds. It was therefore clear that the UK's uplift was as, as a direct result of the low payments here in Scotland. In other words, if it were not for Scotland, there would be no uplift for the UK, so, in the interest of justice, 100% of the UK's conversion uplift should therefore come to Scotland. In a debate here on the 1st of October, it became clear that other parties shared this view. And on the 14th of October, in an unusual step, illustrating Scotland's unassailable case, Rural Affairs spokespeople from Labour, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, and myself, wrote a joint letter on this to Owen Paterson at DEFRA. However, in his announcement last Friday, Mr Patterson del delivered a slap in the face for Scottish agriculture by deciding that the uplift will not be allocated to Scotland after all. Instead, he divided it amongst all parts of the UK, even though England, Wales and Northern Ireland are already above Europe's thresholds. As a result of this decision, Scotland's Pillar 1 budget, the direct payments for farms, will fall from Euros €597 million Euros in the current scheme year to €580 million Euros in 2014 before recovering slightly to €587 Euros, million Euros in 2019. That is a drop of 1.6 per cent cash terms between 2013 and 2019, and of course an even bigger drop in real terms. So Scotland will now receive just over 16 per cent of the external conversion funds, rather than 100 per cent, leaving us with an average of €128 Euros per hectare by 2019. Given we're starting from €130 Euros today, which is the lowest in Europe, that means we're going to be even further away from the European uh, thresholds by 2019. The rest of the convergence money will go to England, Wales and Northern Ireland, even though Wales already, for instance, has €247 Euros per hectare, which is 26 per cent above the minimum of 196 set by Europe, 90 per cent above Scotland. England already has €265 Euros per hectare, over twice as high as Scotland, and Northern Ireland already has €339 Euros per hectare, more than two and a half times the average in Scotland. Now, there have been many examples in my time in this job of examples of, uh, of UK policy undermining Scottish agriculture. And I thought Hilary Benn's decision a few years ago not to compensate sheep farmers for foot and mouth was a low point. But this, I tell the Chamber, is probably even worse than that. It goes against the intentions of the EU, it defies the wishes of this Parliament, and it takes away from Scottish farmers and crofters resources which should be theirs and on which their livelihoods depend. 
No surprise then that Scottish farming and crofting leaders are bitterly disappointed by Mr Patterson's decision. The UK Government tries to defend it by quoting figures not on a per hectare basis but on a farm per farm basis. This is spurious for several reasons. Different countries have different minimum sizes for farms for the purposes of the, the cap budgets and the, the cap policy, so it's not a like for like comparison. And land quality in Scotland is much lower with our situation of having 85% of our land classified as less favoured area, so farms here are bound to be bigger. And most importantly, Europe's entire external convergence process is based on a per hectare figure, a per hectare formula. Europe decided that when it comes to convergence, payments per farmer were totally irrelevant. In fact, I have to tell the Chamber, it's ironic and it's very, very important to note and point out that during the recent agricultural negotiations, Owen Paterson was the first to remind other member states at every available opportunity that payments per farmer were a misleading and irrelevant measure. And indeed, in June, he made the same point to our own Rural Affairs Committee in this Parliament. But now, when it suits him, Owen Paterson uses the opposite argument to take funds away from Scottish agriculture. Moreover, Paterson argued to cut the cap budget even deeper than was actually agreed by Europe, but he's now saying that Scotland's cash is required to help mitigate cuts elsewhere in the UK. Rank hypocrisy. Friday's announcement contained two additional elements on Pillar 1, the direct payments, presumably intended to sweeten the bitter pill. The first is a review of the formula by 2016-17. However, the UK has made clear to me that this review would only look at the next EU budget period, starting in 2021, with no change whatsoever before then. Another red herring. In any case, what's a promise from Westminster worth when both a UK general election will have to come and go and a referendum on EU membership is also due before that date as well? The other additional element is on voluntary coupled support, a part of the policy that is vital for our livestock sector here in Scotland. Scotland asked the UK to secure the option of using up to 15% of our direct payments budget for couple support. Unfortunately, the UK accepted an unlevel playing field, a deal which let other member states secure 13%, but limited us here in Scotland to 8%. I therefore, with industry support, asked Owen Paterson whether Scotland could apply couple support above the 8% of our budget, provided the UK as a whole remained below 8%. Owen Patterson's reply to me merely states that they're prepared to think about increasing our 8%. In any case, this is just damage limitation given the unlevel playing field we're starting with. And it gives no extra money to Scotland and any extra couple support would have to be funded from within Scotland's existing budgets. So this is a small comfort to Scotland's farmers in the context of the overall direct payments decision. So I've spoken about Pillar 1 of the cap, the direct payments for farms, but Freddie's announcement also covered Pillar 2, this is important not only to farmers, but to all those interested in the environment and our rural communities. Here, the European Commission started with high hopes of replacing the current arbitrary allocations with a system based on objective criteria. This principle was strongly supported by the UK Government, and it should have benefited Scotland as under the old system, the existing system, we started out with lower Pillar 2 funding, that's rural development funding, per hectare than every member state of Europe. However, vested interest resisted change, and the final deal was based essentially on historic figures, except that 16 member states insisted on in getting special uplifts. The, e the UK could easily have argued for such an uplift for Scotland, especially given their position of getting the lowest payments in the UK and the whole of Europe, but it, cho it chose not to do so. So from, within the, from the within UK decision, the Scottish Government urged the effort to stick to its principles and use objective criteria. But DEFRA has chosen to go with history. So Scotland will get €477.8 million Euros of Pillar 2 funding for rural development for 2014 to 2020. This is 18.5 per cent of the UK total, the same as our share in 2007 to 13. The UK Government makes much of the fact that in cash terms this is a 7.8 per cent increase, but by their own figures it equates to a 5.5 per cent decrease in real terms. So the overall result of the UK Government's negotiations and decisions is that Scotland will get the lowest per hectare funding in the whole of Europe lower than every other member state in both pillars of the new common agricultural policy. In pillar one, even the lowest of the other member states will get one and a half times what we will get here in Scotland. Ireland will get twice the rate, Belgium three times the rate. And in pillar two, the rural development funding comparisons are even worse. Even the, UK, the EU average is more than six times our puny rate of 12 euros per hectare. 
and member states like Austria and Slovenia will get to 15 to 20 times the amount we will get per hectare. So our environment and rural communities are much, much worse off. And this is a deeply regrettable position we have found ourselves in. And of course, as I said at the beginning, we have some tough decisions to take in the times ahead. This is all about the future of our rural communities, our environment, farming businesses, food businesses, village facilities, other rural facilities, and so on. This is a very serious issue for Scotland. So, presenting officer, in closing, I say I deeply regret the appalling budget position we are in due to the UK Government not making Scottish agriculture a priority. I am meeting farmers' leaders, leaders later this afternoon, and I will assure them that the Scottish Government will continue to work with them and the rural communities to make the case for justice and fairness. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to next business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button now. I call Clea Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of the statement. Um, I share the frustration and disappointment of the Cabinet Secretary that Scotland is not to receive the uplift in full. Across political parties, we agreed that there was a valid argument for Scotland to receive that money because of our low, current low per hectare share. And I believe the UK Government have made the wrong decision on allocation. CAP reform is necessary and convergence is a key part of that reform. And while the UK Government in proposing a review um, appear to recognise the importance of this, the distribution of the funds within the UK is doing nothing to deliver convergence within the UK and it is a missed opportunity. But while I share the disappointment, I don't come to the same conclusions about Scotland's role within the UK. The SNP can give no guarantees on what a negotiated entry into the EU would mean for Scottish farmers and the support they would receive now and in the future. But while that is a debate that will continue over the next year, the Cabinet Secretary after today needs to work with the UK Government to map out how we do achieve convergence within the UK and the review, which he has been very dismissive of, is key to that. There is an opportunity here to adopt a Scottish approach to this and to push for key asks around objective criteria, independent scrutiny and reduced timescales. Is he able to agree to that approach? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I first of all welcome Claire Baker's support for the convergence uplift coming to Scotland and her support was valuable in helping to make uh, Scotland's case. I should point out, of course, that in response to our comments, an independent Scotland simply couldn't do any worse than the negotiations carried out by the, the UK Government. Uh, I have to remind the member that Europe adopted a formula, a formula that applies to all member states, not some member states and not other member states, all member states. Therefore, if Scotland was a member state, that formula would have applied to Scotland and we would have gained a billion euros, not faced the cut we are currently uh, facing. So that is uh, you know, the benefits of membership uh, as a member state under these uh, common, common agricultural negotiations. In terms of the UK Government's agreement to have a review, I, I just have to say that you know, 2017 is quite far away from just now. It is post the in-out referendum in Europe, or at least the same year, if uh, the UK Government happens to be returned to office. And of course, it is post the next UK elections in 2015. Uh, given that I am already dealing with something like my fifth Secretary of State from DEFRA over the past five or six years, I think that is also probably five or six Secretary of States down the line that I have been dealing with. Uh, so, you know, the, the commitment, I feel, is pretty worthless to Scotland and Scottish agriculture. We had the opportunity here and now to deliver the uplift for Scotland, and unfortunately, uh, the UK Government have decided to give us a slap in the face, ignore justice and fairness, uh, and deliver a cut instead of a substantial increase. Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and oh, I'm also grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for the advanced copy of his statement. Um, I very much share the disappointment of everyone in this chamber that the UK Government was unable to deliver the convergence uplift to Scotland. Uh, I would not have signed the cross-party uh, letter that the Cabinet Secretary referred to had that not been the case. But I would venture to suggest that if Richard Lockhead had been the Secretary of State at DEFRA, he would have probably made a very similar decision. I have to say I disagree with the Cabinet Secretary's opinion of the review that uh, Ms Baker has already referred to, that's been pro the review that's been promised by the UK Government. In an effort to be positive, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree to work again with other parties in this chamber to explore the possibilities for improving Scotland's position on area-based CAP funding that I believe the promised review of funding allocation undoubtedly offers. And secondly, 
whether we like the decision or not, the fact is that the Cabinet Secretary now knows exactly what resources he has to play with, and he must now get on and deliver a Scottish CAP, as he has the flexibility to do. In delivering that CAP, will he acknowledge that the 7.8% uplift in Pillar 2 support should reduce the need to modulate funding from Pillar 1, which is designed for and should be used for direct support of Scotland's farmers? Minister. Uh, <coughs> Again, can I thank Alec Ferguson for his support for the position of Scotland. I know that our agricultural sector very much appreciated the cross-party support they had for their case to get 100% of the uplift coming uh, to Scotland. Uh, in terms of the Pillar 2 budgets, I should say that even with the cash increase of the Pillar 2 funds, uh, we will still have the lowest level of rural development funding in the UK and the whole of Europe. That is not something to celebrate uh, and it's something to regret. However, um, in terms of the member's first question is, will I work to improve the uh, formula for Scotland and our, our future budget negotiations? Of course I'll do that. I always work in the interest of Scottish agriculture. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the last few years, and indeed specifically in the last few months in terms of these budget negotiations, is putting first and foremost the interest of Scottish agriculture. It's just a real pity that Alec Ferguson's counterpart, his colleague uh, in the Conservative Party, says of the border, it is not doing likewise. We now move to backbench questions to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I remind members uh, to ask a question, try to avoid the statements, and we'll get through the many members who wish to ask a question. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Um, I wonder if the Minister can uh, welcome what Alistair Carmichael said on his website on the 25th of June 2013 in relation to an EU decision. He said, peripherality is a characteristic that should be supported and protected, suggesting he might have been part of the consensus that emerged on this subject. Isn't it time that Alistair Carmichael became Scotland's man in London and not the other way around? Cabinet Secretary. I do believe that when the new Secretary of State for Scotland, Alistair Carmichael, looks back in, uh, I was going to say a few, years, a few years, but perhaps even a few days, he will be deeply embarrassed by his comments uh, in response to Owen Paterson's decision uh, last Friday. But more importantly, I think that his constituents in Orkney and Shetland will be deeply disappointed and will feel betrayed by the lack of support they've had from the Secretary of State in Scotland on this issue, but it's not too late for him to get behind Scotland's cause in the coming days and weeks over this issue, and the fact that he stood by Owen Paterson's completely indefensible decision. But I do congratulate Stuart Stevenson on his detective skills, uh, and of course he's quite right to highlight that comment from June uh, 2013, because we do have special challenges in this country, and that's why there is a formula in place to make sure that it's a per hectare basis in which the funding is decided. Can I just remind members to keep to questions based on the statement that you've just heard from the Cabinet Secretary? Claudia Beamish, followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to reiterate that we share the Cabinet Secretary's frustration at the UK Government's decision. We also appreciate that he does not have confidence in Owen Paterson's review. However, in view of the continuing importance of modelling for the shift from historic to area payments not having yet been completed, can the Cabinet Secretary give us reassurance in the Chamber today on the timescale for finalising this work to allow the review to proceed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, there's various work underway, and of course we've got our own consultations here in Scotland about to be launched in the Rural Development Programme uh, and indeed the direct payments element of the Common Agricultural Policy uh, as well. But in terms of the comment about not having confidence in the review, we had, of course, another dispute with the UK Government over red meat levies and the fact that our own producers in this country's red meat levies go south of the border and are not used for promoting Scottish red meat produce. Uh, after several years of raising this issue with the UK Government, a few months ago we were promised a review, which will happen uh, in the future, and likewise with the really important issue of the funding formula and convergence of payments between Scotland uh, and the rest of Europe. Uh, here we had a, a decision last week that could have been made in Scotland's favour. It wasn't made in Scotland's favour, but we were promised a review a few years down the line. It's a fudge, and that's all we're getting from the Secretary of State, Owen Paterson. Annabel Ewing, followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Further to this truly rotten deal uh, for Scotland by the Westminster Government, can I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary what impact specifically he thinks that the real terms decrease in Pillar 2 funding will have 
on the key issue of the environment, because I am very worried about that indeed, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said in my statement, there's two sources of funding through the Common Agricultural Policy, direct payments to farming uh, and food production, and secondly, rural development funding, which is pillar two. And that's where, unfortunately, we have uh, a rotten deal uh, as well. And that's, of course, where many of the schemes to support Scotland's natural environment and forestry and agri-environment schemes uh, are funded. It's through pillar two. And therefore, we are missing a huge opportunity to help the many communities and organisations, but most importantly, Scotland's environment, by having a proper stream of funding and a proper deal under Pillar 2. Liam MacArthur, followed by Graeme Day. Uh, also, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the early sight of his statement. Although he rather glossed over the importance of the decision to increase coupled support for Scotland's livestock farmers, I certainly recognise the disappointment on the issue of convergence and the need for a change in the funding model. Uh, on that basis, can he perhaps clarify his plans for moving away uh, from historic production? And can I also assure him uh, that there will continue to be support across the Chamber, not only for an early review, uh, but also for early introduction of changes following that review and certainly uh, before 2020? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. <clears throat> I give a very cautious welcome to the decision to increase couple payments from 8%, and we understand the Secretary of State for Scotland has said it potentially could go to 10%, although we're still waiting for the DEFRA Secretary of State, Owen Patterson, to confirm that. And I don't think anyone in this chamber seriously views moving from 8% uh, to 10% as some sort of fundamental shift that's going to help bring huge benefits to Scottish agriculture. It's perhaps a small step in the right direction, but given other countries are getting 13%, that perhaps puts it into perspective. In terms of plans for moving from historic to area basis, which is the big challenge of the new policy in Scotland, as I said, we will be launching the consultation in December on how we believe the options are shaping up for doing that. The question is will we have a quick transition or a slow transition, and that's one of the fundamental questions which we're speaking to the industry about. Graeme Day, followed by Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given this settlement, the UK Government's plans for an in-out referendum on Europe, and of course the Tories' confirmed intent of all but wiping out direct support for Scotland's farmers, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the only way to provide certainty, a fair deal, and secure long-term future for Scottish agriculture is through independence? Cabinet Secretary. Well, <coughs> it's, a, it's a strange set of circumstances we find ourselves in just now. Uh, if we were independent in Europe, we'd have a billion euros more for direct payments for food production in Scotland. That's £850 million. As part of the Union, we're not getting near, our, near enough our fair share of even the UK allocation, never mind Europe's allocation. But if we go outside of Europe under the Conservative Labour governments down south who have policies of removing direct support from Scottish agriculture, there is a potential for having no support for agriculture in Scotland. We'd be at the mercy of a government in London outside of the common agricultural policy, and therefore the likelihood is there'd be no direct support for Scottish agriculture in Scotland. That is the serious choices uh, facing our farmers and crofters in rural communities. Jimmy McGregor, followed by Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Can the uh, Cabinet Secretary give a guarantee that the new SRDP will start and be up and running on time? And can the Cabinet Secretary set up measures he envisages might be in the new SRDP which will benefit crofters in particular, given concerns that the previous options were impractical and did not cater adequately for small producers who need the subsidy most of all. And assuming the S Scottish Government can take responsibility over any challenge that comes from Europe in relation to increasing couple payments to 10%, how does the Cabinet Secretary envisage this being split between the beef and the sheep sectors? Cabinet Secretary. Okay, there's a number of fair questions there. In terms of preparation for the new Rural Development Programme. We will be launching a consultation uh, in a few weeks' time. I have already put on record we want it to be a lot more simpler, uh, a lot more focused, and we want to learn the lessons of the existing Rural Development Programme, which at times has been, been too bureaucratic and not provided the right support to the right people, albeit it has been overall a very successful programme. Uh, and, of course, the Scottish Government did not design the existing Rural Development Programme. We inherited it from the previous uh, administration. In terms of the use of coupled payments, again, I have put on record that I envisage there is a case for supporting the beef sector through the use of that mechanism. Clearly, it would all depend on what the final percentage is in terms of how much our budget is for coupled payments and also the results of our consultation. Uh, there are differences between supporting the beef sector and the sheep sector through couple payments. Uh, some are more complicated than others in terms of delivery, and we have to take all these factors into account. Mike McKenzie, followed by Graham Pearson. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the comments of Scottish Crofting Federation Parliamentary Spokesman Norman Leask, a constituent of Alistair Carmichael's, that the UK Government's decision amounts to a political heist? And what impact will this have on crofters in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do agree with the comments of crofting leaders, and they must be gutted by this decision last week, given the fragility of many of our crofting communities uh, in this country. And, of course, the reason why support exists in the first place is to help our crofts meet uh, the various challenges they face, from uh, the uh, climatic and geographical challenges they, they face uh, and the fragile communities in which crofting uh, is often based. That's why this funding is so, so important. And it's not just about the direct payments to farms and agriculture, which many crofts do benefit from. It's also how much money can be made available to the Rural Development Programme, from which the less favoured area payments uh, and other support for crofting flows from as well. So this is a very relevant and crucial debate for our crofters in Scotland. Graham Pearson, followed by Angus Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the Secretary of State for Scotland's apparent commitment to a willingness to move towards a coupled support level of 10%. We are all disappointed with the current arrangements for the UK Government, and I'm sure farmers across the south of Scotland will share that uh, disappointment. Can the Cabinet Se Secretary indicate when he will begin the necessary work to produce a suitable case for a change in those percentages? and what kind of timescale he thinks will apply in terms of that work. Cabinet Secretary. The letter I received last week on Friday itself from Owen Patterson, the Secretary of State, announced me of this uh, very regrettable decision, did of course say that he was willing to consider uh, giving Scotland some of the UK's flexibility to use our budget to move from 8% to 10% for coupled payments to support the livestock sector, but appear to suggest there may be some legal issues and other bureaucratic issues surrounding that that have to be ironed out. So at the moment, my officials will be speaking to UK officials to find out exactly what obstacles uh, the UK envisage and how we can take forward uh, that potential extra flexibility. Angus Macdonald, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber what impact the UK Government's decision will have on the wider Scottish economy, given that every one pound of output from agriculture is estimated to generate an additional 80 pence in other parts of the economy? And does he agree with me that the only way to guarantee Scottish farmers and crofters a better deal when CAP is next negotiated is to have a seat at the top table, and that can only be secured with a yes vote in September? Cabinet Secretary. Well, to answer his uh, latter point first, it is of course very obvious to all that I believe every political party in this Scottish Parliament gives a much higher priority to Scottish agriculture than any, port, to any party running the Westminster Government will ever give, as illustrated by the appalling track record of successive uh, Westminster Governments. Uh, in terms of the wider benefit of agricultural support to the rural economy, that is a very, very important point. This is not simply about direct payments going to farmers through the first pillar of the, the policy is about money being spent in our local communities with other businesses, with the whole of the supply chain in the wider rural communities. Farmers, when they get their single farm payment through the cap, they invest that locally in services and the supply chain to have huge benefit for rural employment and the rural economy. So this decision on Friday from the UK Government is a blow not just to our farmers, but to the wider rural economy of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Alison Johnson, then finally David Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement and apologise for missing the beginning of his statement. I recognise that this is a deeply unfair settlement for Scotland. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary comment on how much more difficult it will be to meet climate change and biodiversity targets and what steps will the Government ensure to take that we meet these targets? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's a good question that uh, Alison Johnson asks because one of the key objectives of the new common agricultural policy is to ensure that agriculture across Scotland and all of Europe is greener than before. And of course, many of the measures that will have to be adopted will not just be through regulation of direct payments, but also through the rural development funds for agri-environment schemes and other low carbon schemes that I would like to see included within the new rural development uh, programme for Scotland. Therefore, the less funding we have available, the less we can make these very special and important projects throughout Scotland happen to the detriment of Scotland's biodiversity, our natural environment uh, and, of course, our climate change targets. David Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that Pillar 2 rural development programmes are vital for reducing poverty, for promoting ecosystems and enhancing competitiveness, whose participants, of course, are farmers in the wider rural community? When will the Cabinet Secretary make a decision on the level of voluntary modulation from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2? Cabinet Secretary. The pillar of funding through the Common Agricultural Policy for Rural Development is very, very important, known as Pillar 2. And of course, as the member suggests, we're able to transfer funds between these two pillars. We can take funds out of the Pillar 1, which is farming support, and put that into Pillar 2, which is rural development funding. Uh, in turn, many of the schemes within Pillar 2 also benefit agriculture as well as wider rural Scotland. We have to take a decision on the balance of that transfer, the extent to which we Im impose it. Uh, by the end of this year, and there will be a, a mini consultation with the industry before we decide what percentage we should transfer from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2. Uh, as I have just implied, it is very likely there will be a transfer from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 because of our appallingly low Pillar 2 allocations for rural development. And therefore, if we want to deliver the benefits that Dave Stewart refers to, we have to have a substantial budget under the circumstances uh, under the rural development. Thank you. That ends the questions and uh, statement from the Cabinet Secretary. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 8240 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and move the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing. Minister, you have 13 minutes. I am pleased to open the debate on the general principles of the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill. Uh, a number of committees, in particular the Economy, Energy and Tourism and Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committees, have taken both written and oral evidence in their consideration of this bill, and I would like to thank all those who gave evidence to the committee. I would also like to thank those who responded to the various consultations for their invaluable contributions. These have provided firm foundations for the legislative proposals that have been brought forward and important clarity of a shared understanding of where change is needed. I have read the committee reports and I am pleased to note that the committees agree that the Bill's principles are sound and are broadly supportive. Both the Minister for Enterprise, Energy and Tourism and the Minister for Local Government and Planning are alongside me today, reflecting the fact that this is a cross-government agenda. The three of us would be pleased to speak to our own uh, respective portfolio interests in the Bill during the course of this debate. As members will be aware, the Scottish Government has a clear and unambiguous purpose. That purpose is to focus government and public services on creating a more successful country with opportunities for, for all uh, Scotland to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth. The key components of this purpose, a successful and flourishing Scotland, the creation of opportunities for all and sustainable economic growth cannot and will not be achieved in isolation from each other. Put simply, our country will not flourish without sustainable economic growth, but such growth will be of little value if it does not lead to better, the better flourishing Scotland we all want to see. This bill will improve the way regulations are developed and applied, creating more favourable business conditions in Scotland and better protecting our environment. It will support and empower regulators and provide a clear line of sight between regulatory activity and the Scottish Government's purpose. Collectively, these changes will support those who are regulated to comply, as well as the protection of communities, businesses, individuals and the environment, and support more effective and transparent delivery by a wide range of regulators. The Bill will introduce a range of measures to deliver consistent and proportionate regulation while maintaining local accountability. This will include both the definition and implementation of national standards and systems and a duty on regulators to give due regard to sustainable economic growth in their decision making. A statutory code of practice will also be developed which will describe in more detail how regulators will apply regulatory principles and good practice in order to find the optimum balance. I, I will. Jenny Mara. Can the um, Minister um, explain to me how the principle of sustainable economic growth will be tested where there is no clear legal definition for this? I will come on, to, come on to that point and hopefully uh, Ms Mara will, will understand as I develop my speech just how we hope to take this fo approach forward. The Bill also contains provisions to improve the performance of planning authorities by establishing a link between planning fees and performance. The Bill will also change the mechanism for bringing legal challenges to offshore energy decisions. The Bill aims to give clarity to regulators as to what is expected of them. There are those who say that the protection of the environment and the promotion of sustainable economic growth are incompatible that it is an either-or choice. I understand and I do respect their view, but I disagree with the argument that has been made. They can be compatible, mutually supportive and in harmony. 
Scotland's environment is a national asset that is worth protecting, not only because of its beauty and contribution to our national identity, but also because it is vital to our economic success. Our understanding of the ecosystem services delivered by our environment and natural resources is developing apace, and we estimate that our natural environment generates between 21 and 23 billion of value per annum for Scotland. Many of this country's most successful sectors, such as tourism, food and drink, for example, trout and salmon farming and shellfish growing, and renewables, depend on a clean and healthy environment. It makes absolute sense, therefore, from an individual commercial perspective, as well as from a national economic perspective, that we protect these resources, not just for now, but also for future generations. As I said in evidence to the Iraqi Committee on 5 June, SEPA's primary purpose is and will remain the protection and improvement of the environment, including the sustainable management of natural resources. At present, however, both SEPA and the businesses it regulates operate in an unnecessarily complex legislative landscape. Much of this is down to the iterative way in which regulation has been developed over the years, particularly given the significant requirements created by Europe. However, this has resulted in complexity and a lack of transparency for regulated sectors and businesses. The new framework the Bill will deliver will be easier for regulated businesses and SEPA to understand and administer, and will lead to efficiencies for both, and, it is hoped, improved compliance levels. As a result of the Bill and wider Better Environmental Regulation Programme, SEPA will change the way in which it prioritises regulatory activities. This will ensure that its resources are directed towards the most important, highest risk activities that have the greatest actual or potential environmental impact on communities. Most of all, it will protect our environment and in the round reward and encourage good behaviour. Let's help uh, prevent non-compliance rather than have to mop up breaches after the fact. This is not a leap into the unknown. We already have an example of better environmental regulation in terms of how the Water Framework Directive has been implemented in Scotland. This has enabled the creation of a single permissioning structure. Uh, I certainly will. Jenny Mara. To clarify for me that this reorganisation of SEPA, does he have the power to do this under regulations? Does it require primary legislation? Paul Wheelhouse. There are a number of measures in, in the bill which are required. We, we certainly do feel that this bill is moving uh, SEPA and other regulators onto a footing where they have uh, more enforcement powers and more action to be able to take to prevent serious breaches of environmental regulation. I hope to explore those issues further as I develop my speech, but I'll happily come back to Ms. Maher later. This has enabled the creation of a single permissioning structure and simpler, more consistent procedures, and this is similar in approach to the model we intend to introduce for the other regimes. The benefits of this approach have included excellent stakeholder engagement, close working between the regulator and the regulated, a better understanding of regulations and a simpler, more efficient regulatory service. The Environment Commissioner, uh, Janusz Podocznik, praised Scotland's approach as an exemplar when he visited the Highland Show this year. Improving regulation is an important agenda, not only in Scotland, but also elsewhere in the UK and across Europe. It is important to recognise, however, that while the agenda elsewhere is focused on deregulation or a bonfire of red tape, our agenda is very clearly focused on better regulation and making sure it works effectively for regulators and those they regulate. Yeah. Our vision is for Scotland to be a world leader in environmental protection, and I believe the best way to achieve this is through creating a system of consistent, proportionate and targeted regulation that works. The statutory purpose for SEPA that the Bill will introduce will give a recognition to the broader role that SEPA has and the importance of the environment to our economy and the health and well-being of our communities. It is important to note that although the purpose is new, the need to balance environmental, economic and social considerations is not. As we heard in evidence to committees, balancing judgments are already taken by SEPA, SNH and other regulators on a daily basis. The new statutory purpose for SEPA will formalise what is already current practice and help to provide a line of sight from the Scottish Government's purpose to what our public bodies deliver. Let me again reiterate for the record that we reject the argument that our agenda is about sacrificing the environment to promote economic growth, as some have suggested. As is right and proper, SEPA's primary purpose is and will remain the protection and improvement of the environment. Section 38 of the, the Bill gives primacy to this function of environmental protection, including the sustainable management of natural resources. This will always be at the top of SEPA's hierarchy of responsibilities. However, their approach reflects the fact we cannot look at issues in isolation. The fundamental principle of sustainable development is that it integrates economic, social and environmental objectives. SEPA's new statutory purpose acknowledges the three elements of sustainable development, but gives clear primacy to the environment element. I want to be clear and place that point on record. Happily. Could, could I ask the Minister then, in view of his uh, remarks, why 
he doesn't see it as appropriate to have sustainable development on the face of the bill. Minister. Uh, well, uh, I would put, merely point out to Ms Beamish, as I hope to explore here, that we have established in, in, in Section 38 the three areas, health and wellbeing, which represents a social dimension, sustainable economic growth, which represents the economic argument, but above both is still placed environmental protection and the sustainable management of natural resources. So the three pillars, if you like, of sustainable development are there. The term may not be used, but the three principles are there in a more clear and more explicit way than if you were simply to refer to sustainable development. And let me be equally clear that the duty to contribute to sustainable economic growth does not replace the duties that bodies have as regards sustainable development. Ministers will continue to give guidance on sustainable development in line with statutory obligations. The bill will also give SEPA a wider, more strategic range of enforcement tools to deploy. Combined with the new sentencing options that are given to the criminal courts, those will play a key role in tackling poor performance and non-compliance. The polluter pays principle is already widely accepted and supported. Those proportionate enforcement powers we propose will ensure that offenders pay the price for remedying damage that is done to the environment. All responsible businesses, large and small, will benefit from an effective environment protection system for Scotland. By focusing resources on the greatest environmental harms, SEPA can, offer, uh, can, can more effectively target lawbreakers, support non-compliers to become compliant with regulations and protect communities in our natural environment. To put the new enforcement tools in, to in context, SEPA's approach has been and will continue to be about achieving the right outcomes. Something, sometimes that needs reinforcement uh, through enforcement tools, but sometimes it does not. I opened a conference in Peebles this morning where the focus was an approach uh, we have taken in Scotland to refuse, uh, reducing diffuse pollution. This approach has involved SEPA in a programme of partnership working with the rural sector. There is always a need for a regulatory backstop, but to achieve the maximum benefit for water quality, SEPA has worked closely with the sector and farmers through a campaign to provide advice on compliance with the diffuse pollution general binding rules and improve performance. The outcome of this approach has been very encouraging, with 79% of farms revisited by SEPA having improved their performance without the need to revert to enforcement measures. This is a clear example of the proportionate and effective approach that SEPA have taken and want to continue to take in other areas. The conference has attracted interest from government, regulators and rural sector across the rest of the UK. Our approach has also been quoted by Commissioner Potocnik as an exemplar in Europe, and a recent Chinese delegation are considering how it could be adopted in China. Now, let me be clear, however, that there, where individuals and businesses deliberately or negligently damage the environment, the powers in this bill will enable SEPA to take robust enforcement action. Criminality will not be tolerated. And during a visit to a waste site on the outskirts of Edinburgh earlier this year, I was horrified to hear evidence of serious threats of violence being made against SEPA officers, and in some cases their families, as well as evidence of stalking of SEPA officers on social media. This is totally unacceptable, and I can therefore confirm today that the bill will be supported by a stage two amendment that will make such a behaviour uh, a specific offence. As I said at the outset, I welcome the vital contribution that stakeholders have made to the development of this bill. I also acknowledge and appreciate that there are um, diverse and strongly held views on a number of areas that this bill covers. Going forward, we're committed to working with stakeholders, and I would encourage all stakeholders to continue to engage to help shape this work. This is largely an enabling bill, and much of the detail will be set out in the regulations. Our door remains open for stakeholders to help shape the development of those regulations and their associated guidelines. Colleagues, the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill is not about introducing new regulations in, in, in itself. It is about strengthening the effectiveness of regulations that the Parliament has approved. It is about delivering better regulation. We have strong stakeholder support for much of this work, which will deliver greater regulatory consistency and transparency, efficiency benefits for the regulators and the regulated, protection of the Scottish public, businesses, communities and the environment. And however, I would conclude that there are some that will not benefit from this work. Serial poor performers who are a burden on their competitors, a risk to sustainable economic growth and all that it stands for. I commend the regulatory reform Scotland Bill to the Chamber and urge members to support the principles underlying the Bill at decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. I uh, now call on Murdo Fraser to speak on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Mr Fraser, nine minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to uh, contribute to this debate on behalf of the Lead Committee, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. And can I start by thanking all those who provided written uh, and oral evidence to the committee, to all my fellow committee members and also those on the other committees which uh, consider the bill at stage one. And also put on my uh, record my thanks to uh, our team of clerks who supported us so ably and the members of SPICE who provided advice. 
The committee welcomed the introduction of the bill and agreed to recommend to Parliament that the bill's general principles uh, be uh, agreed. But I should say uh, that that was not the unanimous view of the committee, with two members dissenting. As the lead committee, we took evidence on parts one, three and four of the bill, and I'll concentrate my remarks today on the issues raised in our stage one report. I think it's fair to say, as the Minister pointed out, this is a, a wide-ranging bill covering a, a range of discrete policy areas. Part one has three main proposals. Firstly, it gives Scottish ministers the power to encourage or improve consistency in the exercise by regulators of their functions. Secondly, it introduces a new duty on regulators to contribute to achieving sustainable economic growth. And finally, it includes a code of practice uh, to assist regulators. Firstly, the enabling power. Well, the aim of that is to improve how regulations are developed and applied so that they create a more favourable set of business conditions whilst also delivering environmental benefits. Standardising how regulations are implemented is intended to tackle the economic impact on the business community in dealing with inconsistently applied regulations. Now, the committee heard concerns that this power for ministers would centralise decision making and thus remove democratic accountability and local knowledge and circumstances from the decision making process, a point particularly made by local authorities. And the committee welcomed the fact that the Scottish Government and COSLA uh, agreed a memorandum of understanding to achieve consistency in the exercise of regulatory functions and future national standards. This is something the committee uh, welcomed, and in particular the, this collaborative approach that it demonstrated, and we hope that it will result in national standards which are transparent, workable, and take account of local circumstances. Indeed. Minister Fergus Ewing. Could, could uh, the Scottish Government place on record its uh, gratitude to COSLA and Stephen Hagen and his assistance in the work that uh, we have done in this regard? And could I offer Mr Fraser's convener of the committee uh, an unqualified assurance that uh, our collaborative work with COSLA will continue throughout the course of this bill to make sure that it uh, works in a way which does not imperil local democracy in this country? Thank you. Lord Fraser. Uh, I, th I thank the Minister for, for his intervention and for that assurance, which I'm sure will be welcomed uh, by committee members. There was widespread support the committee heard for inclusion in the Bill of Exemptions to National Standards, enabling regulators to opt out of national standards where exceptional local circumstances exist. Witnesses did ask for clarity on the circumstances whereby an exemption would apply and for a consistent ad approach to be adopted to this. And we recommended that the exemption criteria be included in either the forthcoming code of practice or within the guidance which will accompany uh, the bill. It's a little bit disappointing that the minister did not agree this was necessary, but the proposal to publish ministerial directions in respect of exemptions or variations is welcome. And it would be helpful if the minister could, when he's speaking, clarify where these directions will be published and how will he ensure that regulators are aware of them. And I want to turn to probably the most contentious issue in the bill, which was the duty on regulators to contribute to achieving sustainable economic growth. We received a lot of evidence on this provision, and a number of concerns were raised by witnesses. We also heard that there is no legal definition uh, at the moment of sustainable economic growth. And as a consequence, regulators could face legal challenges as to how they chose to comply with that duty. As a committee, we were clear that for regulators to be able to comply with that duty, they must understand its meaning. Now, during the evidence sessions, we heard many different definitions of sustainable economic growth. Somebody even suggested the one from Wikipedia. I'm not sure that's very helpful to the lawmaking process, Deputy Presiding Officer. But the Scottish Government did provide the committee with its definition and explained that was the one they wanted to see regulators use. Now, because this, in the end, might be a matter for the courts to decide, um, I think the Scottish Parliament and Government have a duty to try and minimise the risk here. And the Committee asked the Scottish Government to ensure that its definition of sustainable economic growth is explicitly stated. And if it's not going to appear in the Bill, it needs to be absolutely clear in subsequent guidance. And the Scottish Government gave a commitment that drafts, uh, or, or rather we asked that a commitment be made, that drafts of guidance are submitted to Parliament for scrutiny prior to it being published. The Minister indicated in his response to our report that the definition will be included in the Code of Practice, which is subject to parliamentary scrutiny, but made no mention of providing details and the guidance to regulators on how they will be expected to comply with the duty. And given the importance of this point, I'd be grateful the Minister could address it uh, when he is contributing uh, later. The Law Society of Scotland, amongst others, expressed the firm view that the duty raises questions 
of legal uh, enforceability. And many witnesses question how regulators would be able to demonstrate that they had contributed to achieving that goal of, of sustainable economic growth and express concerns that might leave their decisions open to legal uh, challenge. There was a particular area of concern in relation to uh, issues around planning applications. And we were therefore pleased that the Minister decided to exclude the planning functions of local authorities from complying with the new duty. There were also concerns raised by many witnesses about a, a, a conflict of uh, interest situation. We, we heard in a contribution a moment ago from, from Jenny Mara about the existing definition of sustainable development. Some people said that would be better to be in the bill because it's better understood. The Scottish Government were quite clear uh, in, their, in their response to that and in evidence the Minister said that regulators were not to prioritise sustainable economic growth over other duties and that the code of practice would provide guidance to them on balancing competing duties, which again is why it's so uh, important. So the uh, committee is of the view that we want to take evidence from our stakeholders uh, on the draft code of practice before the final version is laid before Parliament and we welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to publish the guidance that will accompany the bill and that it will consult widely on the draft code of practice. I want to turn to part three of the bill briefly, which deals with three points, the most contentious of which was this uh, issue of linking the level of planning fees to the performance of a planning authority. Now, it's clear to the committee that an efficient and uh, uh, effective planning system benefits us all, and we had a lot of views from the business community that they wanted to see a more streamlined uh, planning system. And the business community were, were of the view that the 20% uplift in planning fees that's coming forward should be reflected in an improvement in planning authority performance. But a lot of people who gave us evidence thought that reducing the income to under-resourced planning authority would only exacerbate the problem. So the committee welcomed the Minister's confirmation that positive measures would be used initially before any reduction uh, in planning fees. When it came to measuring performance, the committee was not convinced that the Scottish Government's statistical data could adequately determine the performance of planning authorities and welcome confirmation that it will now use both quantitative and qualitative measures to assess performance. We are aware that COSLA remain opposed to linking planning fee levels to the agreed uh, performance markers. Uh, it's important that this issue is resolved prior to the conclusion of the Bill's parliamentary passage, Deputy Presiding Officer, and any update on progress from the Minister today would be welcome. Uh, right on cue, Minister. Thank you. I thank uh, Mr Fraser for taking the intervention. I think it may always be the case that I may never convince COSLA that a penalty mechanism is in their interest, but the Scottish Government does believe it is in the interest of the planning system to, in addition, have very positive mechanisms to improve performance, but also have that mechanism should all else fail. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to that, to the Minister, for that intervention. It was very interesting in the passage of the Bill. There was a, there was a clear divergence of opinion from the business community, who were very enthusiastic about these proposals, and people on the other side, particularly from local authorities, who were much more, much more concerned. And I think uh, a, a conciliatory approach being adopted by the Scottish Government, which is more about carrot than stick, will go down uh, very well uh, with, with COSLA. Uh, I'm aware I'm short of time, Presiding Officer. I may very briefly cover, cover a couple more points. The marine licensing provisions in the bill we, we largely uh, welcomed in terms of streamlining the current process. Um, there was similarly uh, unanimous support for the uh, uh, improving the issue of certificate of compliance for mobile food vans, so those who travel around country selling burgers and ice creams no longer have to get 32 separate licenses, but can rely on one, which I'm sure will be very uh, welcome. The Minister has indicated a number of stage two amendments being brought forward, one on primary authority, which uh, we look forward to taking evidence on at stage two, uh, and some suggestion uh, at the last minute that there will be other proposals, one on the imposition of fixed penalties uh, for carrier bags, uh, one on the, abandon, the, the um, uh, uh, amendment of the abandoned mines provisions in the Control of Pollution Act 1974 to deal with cases where contaminated land falls to the Crown, and finally allowing Scottish ministers to authorise fuels which can be burnt in smoke control areas. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more details of these, uh, either in the course of this debate or subsequently. Uh, can I say, in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, this was a very comprehensive, wide-ranging bill. It is well-intentioned. It has generally uh, been welcomed. And it certainly it was the majority view of the committee uh, that it should proceed. Thank you. Many thanks. I uh, now call on Jenny Mara. Nine minutes, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Federation of Small Businesses has pointed out, regulation is necessary to protect our environment and our communities from harm. And through this bill, I think we have the opportunity to enshrine in law the expectations, practices, relationships and penalties for those many bodies that carry a regulatory function. However, sadly, I think this bill does fall short of those expectations. Labour's contributions today will cover both sections of the bill, with my colleague Margaret McDougall focusing on part one and Claudia Beamish examining some of the environmental aspects contained in part two. That leaves me to introduce the main areas that we feel need addressing. Now, central to our concerns, presiding officer, and reflected in a wide range of evidence to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, is the loss of local accountability when regulations are made, changed or removed. The bill gives the government a great deal of power over future regulatory reform, but there is little in the way of scrutiny on how that power will be used. Indeed, the committee report states that it heard from many witnesses who had difficulty understanding the implications of the proposed enabling power due to the lack of detail available on the circumstances in which it would be used or who, would, who it would apply to. And both the SCDI and the Law Society have expressed concern that there is no clarity around the duty, making it difficult to interpret what the bill will achieve in practice with the Law Society urging Parliament to clarify the approach that the Scottish Government is taking. My fear, presiding officer, is that the approach the Scottish Government is taking is to centralise the power to set, change and create new regulations to fulfil a more modest policy intention of providing national standards in regulation. And in the process, we are losing transparency and accountability because the bill as it stands does not allow Parliament to scrutinise those powers, although they're being centralised, and the changes to, reg to the regulatory frameworks that they will bring. And with a number of businesses and stakeholders voicing similar concern, we need to know what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that changes are made democratically and transparently. Particularly, I would urge them to reconsider whether the super-affirmative procedure is a more democratic way of exercising their powers. And with regards to the national standards themselves, I appreciate the need to eradicate duplication and inconsistency. However, must this come at the sacrifice of local decision-making? Unison and the Scottish Trade Union Congress have both questioned how the legislation strikes the right balance, with Unison stating, authorities must be able to set their own standards and respond to local situations. And while I'm glad the Minister is working with COSLA, I would urge the Government to consider whether the face of the bill needs changing to reflect the memorandum of understanding that has been reached. As Andrew Fraser of North Ayrshire Council said, it is unusual for legislation to require a non-statutory mem memorandum of understanding to make it acceptable and workable. Now, I agree with that statement. We need legislation that is sustainable on its own. If the government are bringing forward national standards, they have the responsibility to balance those standards with the duty on local authorities to respond to local needs. Going from a provision that isn't in the bill to one that shouldn't be, I want to touch upon the duty to promote sustainable economic growth. Now, with just 29% of those consulted agreeing this duty should be in the bill, there are serious concerns about how it will work in practice, and this has already been aired today. The STUC, in their submission to the committee, have argued strongly that a mandatory duty on regulators to pursue economic growth could create a conflict of interest with their function to regulate. Yes. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I'm, I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention, but I hope that uh, Ms Mara picked up the point I was making in my, my opening uh, statement, that we have a situation here where SEPA, for example, is being asked to look at sustainable economic growth in the context of health and well-being, but also with the overriding uh, statutory duty on environmental protection and sustainable match management of natural resources, which takes primacy in, the, in that arrangement of three different uh, duties. And those are three pillars of sustainable development. 
Nimara. I thank the, the Minister for that clarification. In my reading of the bill, it seems to me that this uh, duty for sustainable economic growth overrides a lot of the other regulatory considerations, and we would, we would look for, for that to be clarified. And that is certainly the concern of a lot of the people who gave evidence to the committee, because only 29% of those consulted agreed that this duty should be in the bill, because it does override other regulatory functions. They note that duties on the STUC note that duties on the Financial Services Authority, which prevented them from introducing new regulatory barriers or discouraging the launch of new financial products, severely weakened their ability to regulate the banking sector effectively. And that shows that conflict of interest. Scottish Environment Link has said that the duty could override environmental protection or well-being. And the Law Society has raised significant concerns about the validity of a duty that is not properly defined in law, as we have rehearsed this afternoon. Unison have stated that without a legal definition, it will be hard for regulators to make clear-cut decisions, and they may be left vulnerable to challenge through the courts, even with the Minister's proposed code of practice. And the implications of this... Yes. Fergus Ewing. I mean, I'm very grateful for Jenny Mara giving way, but does she not recognise that in Section 4 of the Bill, it quite clearly states in relation to the regulator's duty in respect of sustainable economic growth, that in exercising its regulatory functions, each regulator must contribute to achieving sustainable economic growth, except to the extent that it would be inconsistent with the exercise of those functions to do so. That surely uh, makes it clear that what Jenny Mara said, that the economic duty would override those functions, is factually incorrect. Mara, give me a little more time. Minister, I, I don't accept your assertion, because if you have the, um, the duty of sustainable economic growth without a properly defined legal interpretation of that, then the whole thing becomes a very grey area and is open to many, many arguments in court. And that is, the, that is the view of the Law Society of Scotland, and that is the view of many people who gave evidence to the committee. It may not be the Minister's view, but actually only 29% of the respondents to this consultation agree, agreed that this duty should go in. Now, I think we will have an ongoing debate about this this afternoon, and probably at stage two, and stage three, but I think we should really get to the nitty gritty of what the impact of this will be. Because the implications of this were put to the committee by Professor Andrea Ross of the University of Dundee, who said, regardless of how this government interprets sustainable economic growth, there is no guarantee that a future government or the courts will not interpret it to mean a stable economy with no mention of its impact on ecological and social sustainability. Now, that is a legal expert who put that to the committee. Given the level of opposition, I am not convinced that the duty should be in the bill. I see no reason why the widely used and legally defined duty for sustainable development is insufficient. Presiding officer, I fear this bill is suffering from one narrow aim, to centralise power. Yes. Derek Mackay. Just for clarity, and I thank the member for taking the intervention, does the Labour Party support sustainable economic growth? The Labour Neymar. Party does indeed support sustainable economic growth, presiding officer, but not of the cost of absolutely everything else. Hard, hot for health and safety regulations that are very, very important to workers, the workforce and our local authorities. I fear this bill has one narrow aim to centralise that power. We are scant on the detail of how it will be used, but we know that that power will be exercised here in Edinburgh rather than in our local communities. Regulations must work for the communities they keep safe, for the businesses they affect and the environment they protect. We are uneasy with much of this bill, and when we take these concerns out, we are left with a reorganisation of SEPA for which we do not need primary legislation thus leaving us with not much to support at all. We will be voting against the principles. I th I've Gosh, taken all three the interventions. The really coming close to closing. Of time, Minister. We will be voting against the principles of the bill tonight, and we hope that the government will reconsider many of these measures before stage two. Thank you. Many thanks.
Now call on Gavin Brown. Six minutes, please, Mr Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we welcome uh, much of what is in the Bill today. We think it is a step in the right direction with much to do, I think, still in regulatory reform, both in principle and in terms of the Bill itself. But we shall be voting for it uh, at five o'clock today in support, as I say, much of what is in there. It is a common complaint from business of all uh, shapes and sizes that the volume and burden of red tape is too much. The Federation of Small Businesses Scotland survey recently said that 45 per cent of those surveyed say the cost of compliance has risen over the last year, and 29 per cent say that the time of complying with regulation has increased over the course of the last year. Some of the regulation out there clearly is necessary, some of it less so, but by having as much as we do, it can stifle potential and innovation, and it can make us ultimately, as a country, less productive. So we welcome the bill, we welcome the better regulation agenda and indeed the work of the regulatory review group. It's not just regulation itself, of course, it's the way in which regulation is interpreted and enforced that causes much of the angst across the business community. So let's have a look at some of the key issues, many of which have been touched on already. And the first one is the duty of regulators in respect of sustainable economic growth. Section 4 uh, of the bill, of course, to be read in conjunction with sections uh, 5 and 6. This uh, means that regulators have to contribute uh, to achieving sustainable economic growth. Now, as a principle, uh, that is something that my party supports. I certainly support it. And it's something that was pretty similar to what was in our manifesto, uh, both in 2007 and indeed uh, 2011. It gives a signal uh, for government that it is a priority, it raises the profile of the issue, and it gives a clear vision, I think, uh, that Scotland needs sustainable economic growth. And I have to say, I, I do not agree with the comments made by uh, Jenny Marra that this will override all the other uh, duties that regulators may have. I think the Minister was right to point out the precise wording uh, of Section 4, and there are two parts within that section that I think are relevant. Uh, the first one is that regulators have to contribute it is not an overwriting duty. They have to contribute uh, to it. And secondly, there is a clear exception uh, for all regulators that where it is inconsistent with the exercise of their functions, they do not have to do so. I think there are two parts to that single section, even before we come to guidance in the Code of Practice. That actually means the overriding argument, I think, is possibly overblown and is not one uh, that ought to be central to the debate. That said, Deputy Presiding Officer, there were, I think, uh, questions raised and some fair points put forward, both by those who are against the principle and, indeed, those who are in favour of the principle. The conclusion, I think, was which that the, the success of this section and, indeed, of the Bill as a whole depends almost entirely upon the guidance issued by the Government under uh, sections 5 and 6 uh, and, indeed, the code of practice under those same sections. The FSB basically stated as follows. How the code is monitored and reported will determine how effective it will be in changing practice. And I think they're right to say that. And that's where the government, I think, has to focus its uh, remarks in closing or in, in terms of middle speeches, but also in terms of going forward to section two and section three. Some very fair questions were put forward. How do we ensure, from those that are in favour of it, how do we ensure that the duty is actually enforced on the ground at an operational level, which is actually where it matters. How do we avoid legal challenges? I think a fair comment uh, made by Jenny Mara and others. None of us want to see uh, time taken up through the courts. Um, how do we make sure that that is narrowed down so that it doesn't happen? And for those who I think are concerned about the overriding idea, um, how does it sit alongside the primary purpose of the regulators and how do they balance the priorities? I think it's critical that the code of practice and the guidance are right. I was pleased to hear uh, from the convener of the committee uh, that the EET committee will specifically take evidence on the code of practice and on the guidance to make sure uh, that both parliament and government uh, gets this right. I do believe it can be done, Deputy Presiding Officer, in uh, trawling through the written submissions made to the committee. I did note that Oscar, uh, in their written evidence, said that it already reports on sustainable growth as required by Section 321A of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010. So it's not without precedent. We have one uh, regulator, as it were, um, already having to conform to wording pretty close 
uh, to what is put forward uh, in this bill. So while there is much to be done, uh, I think I'm persuaded that it can be done um, through stages two and three of the bill. Uh, we heard Deputy Presenting Officer about primary authority partnerships. Uh, again, I think we approve uh, quite strongly of that. There's a cost efficiency, I think, for business, there's a cost efficiency for local authorities and a greater consistency uh, across the board, um, which I think is important for all concerned. I think it would be helpful to hear from the Minister uh, when he closes. What is the analysis of the responses uh, to the consultation and what is the updated position of the Scottish Government in relation to that? We would certainly uh, want to hear. Uh, we heard about the planning authorities, uh, Deputy Presenting Officer. I, I, I wonder if the planning minister is speaking and it would be helpful I think to hear from the government what is their definition likely to be of unsatisfactory performance what are the sort of levels of reduction that we're talking about and what sort of measures could be there um, before reducing I wonder if I have time to, to take that intervention yes, you have. I do happy to, to take the intervention I thank uh, the member for taking the intervention I don't have a dedicated speaking slot but I'm certainly here to answer questions such as that uh, we have a high level group that has established uh, high level uh, principles around what is good performance and thereby can define poor performance as by those measures that we will be able to determine uh, in the way that Mr Fraser has outlined a, a, a range of issues to determine whether a planning authority is performing well or not. Thank you. Closing now. I'm grateful for that intervention, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to hear that uh, some work is being done. Um, I just note that Audit Scotland said specifically it needs to be qualitative and quantitative. And SCDI, who are uh, very pro-business in much of what they say, did say uh, beware of creating false incentives to, to prioritise speed over optimal result results. Both of those pieces of advice, I think, are, are worthy. Um, in closing, then, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, there is still work to be done, I think, on the bill, as highlighted uh, by the various committees. No doubt there will be other suggestions over the course of the debate, uh, but it is, it is ultimately a step in the right direction, which is why we'll be supporting it uh, come five o'clock. Thank you. Many thanks. We now move to open debate, and I call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Six minute speeches, please. President Officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate, not just because I'm a member of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, but also because of my previous career in running a business over many years, when I often used to ask myself the question, who regulates the regulators? And it was clear to me then that much of our regulation was inconsistent and disproportionate, often placing regulatory powers in the hands of people who used it unwisely and without proper regard for the wider consequences. Having said this, I fully acknowledge that I have a particular genetic defect that sometimes gives me or gave me difficulties when it came to dealing with regulators. President officer, you may not be surprised to know that I completely lack the forelock tugging gene. And as hard as I try, I cannot force my hand up to grasp it. Regula regulators did not always appreciate this. The recent Federation of Small Business Survey of Members indicated that a substantial portion of their members reported an increase in the cost of dealing with regulation over the last year. I wonder how this cost has increased over the last 30 years. I suspect we know what the answer is. I wonder too at the wider cost of this to our country in terms of growth, or the lack of growth and prosperity. And I wonder too at this in terms of numbers of jobs and of living standards and in terms of tackling poverty. I pay particular regard to the voices of small businesses on this matter because often the bur burden of regulation falls most heavily on the shoulders of small business, on those who are least able to bear it. Having said this, I fully understand the need and requirement for regulation. Without it, we cannot function as a civilised society. Without it, our quality of life and of our environment would plummet. What we need, therefore, in considering improvements to regulation is for it to be more consistent and less of a blunt instrument. I believe this bill does exactly that, not as a final solution, but as a step on the road towards better regulation. In terms of environmental regulation, I believe the bill gives SEPA a valuable toolkit that will enable them to protect their environment more effectively, freeing up resources to tackle serious environmental problems 
and crimes, whilst offering a lighter touch to business, businesses who have every intention of compliance. And it is often the case, too, that regulation varies from one local authority to another, for no good reason. Certainly, yeah. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Is the member aware that the STUC, in giving evidence, suggested that Scotland is already a good place to do business. It's part of the second least regulated product market in the developed world and the third least regulated labour market. Mike McKenzie. I'm not quite sure exactly how uh, you measure that, but uh, um, certainly I listen carefully to Scottish businesses on these matters. The, it's often the case that, as I was saying, that regulation varies from one local authority to another for no good reason. And the committee did hear evidence of this. Some regulators, principally local authorities in COSLA, gave evidence that they were unhappy about this and on the basis that it conflicted with the concept of local democracy. They were unfortunately unable to give a single example of this in practice. And it seemed that their concerns were purely abstract. I welcome, though, the government's assurances that they're prepared to consider exceptions. There were some concerns, too, from witnesses about the economic duty. I'm afraid that apparent opposition of some regulators to sustainable economic growth rather makes the case for this duty to be enshrined in legislation. I simply cannot understand why anybody should be opposed to this and why the term sustainable seems not to be understood. Much of this, this discussion seemed to be merely semantic and once again, none of the witnesses were able to give a single practical example that illustrated their concerns. Um, perhaps I could give the member a, an example. Um, Alison Johnson. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Um, just to suggest that building a golf course on a triple SI, um, that's an example of the environment taking second place to economic considerations. Mr McKenzie. As, uh, as I was saying, none of the witnesses gave an example um, and, and I think perhaps in some quarters the jury is still out on that matter. The matter of planning fees prompted some interesting discussion, with some witnesses firmly of the belief that since planning delivered a public good, that full cost recovery from fees was inappropriate. Our planning system is the midwife to sustainable economic growth. And I'm delighted that the Minister is focusing on a range of improvements which will help deliver this growth whilst protecting and, in fact, improving the quality of our built and natural environment. The notion that sustainable economic growth is incompatible with this is, I think, a dismal notion that could condemn us to slow growth and a failure to reach to any course, of our please. aspirations. The Minister increased, has recently has, intends to increase planning freeze, but it's only proper that developers and public alike see an increase in performance. In conclusion, President Officer, I look forward to the forthcoming Code of Practice, which I'm sure will offer reassurance to anyone who has remaining doubts about the Bill and to the enhanced and sustainable economic growth that this legislation will help to deliver. Many thanks. Now call on Margaret McDougall to be followed by Graham Day. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as a member of the EET Committee, I, I'm happy to take part in this debate this afternoon. The Regulatory Reform Bill aims to cut back on the hoops certain organisations need to jump through by streamlining and standardising certain parts of the process. However, I do have a number of concerns which I wish to raise today and I hope that at the very least these will be addressed at stage two. I will focus on the increasingly centralised agenda displayed within the bill and the planning changes set out. I will also briefly mention street traders' licences. Local democracy is central to our society. We should be looking where possible to devolve powers to where they are most applicable and while I am sure all of us in this chamber support consistency, we must ensure that we are not stripping local councils of their functions. In evidence to the committee, COSLA spokesperson Michael Cook stated that local communities should remain empowered and have the right to differing standards to reflect different local circumstances and desired outcomes. 
Well, could you just give me some time to proceed? And Unison also said in evidence that authorities must be able to set their own standards and respond to local situations. National standards and systems conflict with the bottom-up approach recommended in the Christie Commission report, which the government welcomed, and that local authorities have a range of different aims. I will happy to take that intervention now. Mike McKenzie. Uh, would you acknowledge that Mr Cook, uh, whilst making this point in a theoretical sense, was unable to give any practical examples at all of where this has occurred? Margaret McDougall. I mean, I think COSLA have been very straightforward in their support or un of not supporting this uh, proposal. And I will mention it uh, another quote later on in my speech. I fully agree with the point I had mentioned. In most cases, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Planning authorities operate in very diverse communities, so need different strategies and solutions to deal with their own unique situations, or else we run the risk of national standards undermining local democracy. If you are very brief, Minister. Minister Dirk Mackay, briefly, please. Let's just ask the member, is she not conflating the points between what she sees as consistency or centralisation and what we are proposing with planning? The alternative south of the border, if there is a poorly performing planning authority, the Minister takes absolute control through his inspector of that planning department. I am not proposing that for Scotland. We are proposing encouraging conditions to improve performance, and if that fails, that authority would not enjoy continued increases in planning fees, which would be unfair. I thank the Minister for that intervention, but I think all the evidence we had agreed that to remove funding from the local authority was detrimental to that planning authority. So we should not be looking to burden local authorities with a set of national standards that do not work for them. While I do acknowledge the need for consistency, I would argue this may be better provided through best practice guidelines and coordination rather than central government. In referring to the proposal to link planning application fees to the performance of the planning authority, this would mean Scottish ministers can reduce fees to underperforming planning authorities where it felt they were operating less than satisfactorily. We need to be extremely careful in the way in which this proposal is implemented. And despite being a relatively small part of the bill, it was one of the most frequently answered of all the consultation questions. The Royal Town Planners Institute in its briefing stated they were disappointed that ministers intend to pursue a statutory mechanism to penalise authorities who they consider to underperform. The RTPI go on to say it would be counterproductive to withdraw funding and that a national continuous improvement programme should be in place. Firstly, I would ask, what does the government mean by satisfactory or unsatisfactory performance? This is not defined anywhere in the bill. And who makes this decision? I know the minister, and if you just, um, I'll give you, I'll let you in in a minute or two. I know you did uh, answer that to uh, a former speaker, and, but I would ask you then, that you said there was a working group. When will that working group report to uh, the committee or to this chamber? Members, in our last minute now, Mr Mackay, a very brief intervention. I am happy to share all the workings of the high-level group with all members of Parliament so they are fully informed as to what the key performance indicators are, and hopefully that will give the members some reassurance. Mark. Seconds, please. Right, thank you. I am now running very short of time. Can I just um, add that a... While the, the role democratically elect, what role will the democratically elected councillors would play under this new system? As I understood it, it was their job to scrutinise the process. With this fun will this function now be removed? COSLA is not supportive of the proposal, as Stephen Hagan stated in his letter to the EET committee, describing it as fundamentally too much ministerial in interference in the operations of a specific council service. 
So what discussions is the Scottish Government having with the councils to resolve this issue and what role will local councillors have under this new system? To conclude, Presiding Officer, I hope the Scottish Government will take on board the concerns I have raised today and make the necessary changes at stage two to avoid the distinct feeling of a creeping centralisation being experienced by local authorities over some of the proposals in this bill. Many thanks. Now, Colin Graham Day to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't think any reasonable person would question the wisdom desirability, or desirability of what this bill seeks to achieve. Improved regulation and ability to regulate surely benefits all. The challenge in relation to the areas of it that the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, as a secondary committee, scrutinised is that in facilitating sustainable economic growth, we in no way compromise or give rise to the possibility of compromising protection of our environment or the natural heritage. The committee's scrutiny of the bill centred essentially in Part 2, covering environmental legislation, along with those areas of Part 1 relating to SEPA and SNH. In written evidence, SNH revealed it had no difficulty with the principles of the bill, but admitted it was not fully clear on its priorities and purpose. SEPA, it should be acknowledged, revealed itself to have a clear understanding of its role, stating that its new general purpose, as drafted in Section 38 of the bill, accurately reflected the manner in which it operates currently. The Environment Minister told the committee he did not intend the duty on sustainable economic growth to subvert in any way SEPA or SNH's existing regulatory duties, and that only when there was no conflict would regulators take economic impact into account. The committee nevertheless came to the view that, given SNH's hugely important role in securing the conservation, enhancement, understanding enjoyment, sustainable use and management of the natural heritage, that a similar provision to that provided SEPA by Section 38 might reasonably be applied. The Minister indicated he did not feel this to be necessary. However, whilst largely reassured by the Minister's evidence, we did remain of the opinion that the hierarchical, mo hierarchical model set out in Section 38 might still be deployed to provide that clarity. The intention in this regard is understood. We simply were of view that it might just be more clearly understood were the Government prepared to take this approach. The Minister indicated that regulators would be able to identify the outcomes of their new duties in future annual reports, but the Committee was concerned that if regulators were unclear on what the duty would mean for them in practical terms, that would impinge on their ability to report, although we welcomed the Government's commitment to produce, in consultation with stakeholders, appropriate guidance. And of course, the, the undertaking, given that the statutory code of practice will be comprehensive and define what is expected of regulators as regards their duties under Section 4, is also to be welcomed, providing the guidance does include instruction as to how to resolve any conflict which arises between compliance and their primary functions and achieving sustainable economic growth. Things have, of course, moved on with the creation of the Scottish Regulators Code of Practice Working Group to develop the draft code with a view to entering into full consultation later in the year. And the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism reiterating, reiterating in evidence and again today that sustainable economic growth is not to be prioritised over other regulatory objectives. It, that is simply something uh, to which regulators must have regard. Therefore, the direction of travel is one which satisfies the concerns of this member of the committee. From the evidence we took, however, there was a further concern expressed as to how a high-level code of practice designed to be applicable to a wide range of regulators could be meaningful and effective. Subsequent ministerial reassurance that the new code was not designed to replace but to complement the detailed and specific subject codes already in existence um, in other words, the already well-functioning codes specific to individual regulators would remain their driver, has, however, I think, allayed those fears. However, the Rural Affairs Committee may well, like EET, renew our interest in the subject prior to the draft code being finalised and laid before Parliament. Moving on, can I very much welcome the planned enhancing of SEPA's powers of enforcement through the Bill and planned government amendments. The package of measures we may end up with by Stage 3, judging by what is contained within the Bill as drafted in the government proposed st stage two amendments will, I think, give those who police and protect our environment the means to do so effectively. The planned new section focusing on SEPA's investigatory powers with a view, amongst other things, to determine any financial benefit that has accrued in relation to serious env environmental crime is welcome. The proposed amendments to Schedule 2, which will mean permits can be varied, suspended or revoked if the holder ceases to be deemed a fit and proper person, or for a permit transfer to be refused if the would-be uh, transferee is not a fit and proper person, are similarly welcome. As are the intended amendments to Section 69 and 166 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act. 
Uh, there were some concerns raised that SEPA might use their power, new powers to impose fixed penalty fines in relation to weaker cases rather than pursue the issue through the court process. But SEPA stated in evidence that in practice he would still have to carry out a thorough investigation into the evidence and that guidelines to be provided by the Lord Advocate would further direct their approach. The committee was told that the nature of the offence and whether criminal intent was involved would be taken into account in determining the balance of probability. Presiding officer, as a member of the committee, I was particularly pleased to learn that regulations made under the bill will enable SEPA to consider issues on a company-wide rather than an individual site basis. This will ensure that organisations who have a corporately bad attitude to the environment will be appropriately held to account, not just slapped across the wrist, because at an individual location level, their actions are deemed to be significantly serious. Plans to issue publicity orders are also a step forward. Publicity orders may be used alongside or in place of alternative sentences. Someone convicted of an offence would be required to make public details of the misdemeanour and the sentence imposed. Discretion on whether or not to deploy this approach would lie with the court. And it does strike me that used in a common sense way, um, which draws a distinction between a one-off accidental breach and a perpetrator deliberately playing fast and loose with the environment is another useful weapon in the Environmental Protection Army. And allowing for directors of a company and similar office holders to be prosecuted for the offence of failure to comply with the publicity order in certain circumstances is another logical accompanying step. Can I, in conclusion, also welcome moves to better protect SEPA officials from threats of violence and intimidation? The committee heard of cases of serious organised environmental crime in which SEPA officials had been subjected to such threats. SEPA officers carry out hugely important work on our behalf and they must be afforded the fullest protection and backing. Many thanks. I now call on Claudia Beamish to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by identifying myself as a member of the Royal Affairs Committee with uh, many of the remarks that my colleague Graham Day has made. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity to speak in this debate um, about the phrase sustainable development and to ask that the ministers consider that this, do, that this does come on the face of the bill. Further, that the, that the term sustainable economic growth does not appear on the face of the bill without a clear statutory definition, and I don't believe this is semantics. Sustainable economic growth does, as others have said, lack legal clarity and is not, in my view, a sufficiently holistic approach and therefore is more likely to founder. There is, there is already a term whose legal meaning is clear and that is holistic by definition. That term is sustainable development. And for these reasons, and others raised by colleagues, we will not be able to support the bill at this stage. Very brief. Paul I, do want to I, I'm, I am grateful, and, uh, and I hope, hope I don't disrupt the flow. I just wanted to point out that European Environment Council level, uh, the member states are actually currently discussing the definition of sustainable development and pointed out, the German government actually pointed out it doesn't even include the, the phrase environment. So in terms of European policy, there's a lot of thinking needs to be done on how to define sustainable development. And I think in the bill, in Section 38, it made it quite clear for SEPA exactly what we mean. I'll give you a little extra time. Uh, I, I am going on to develop um, arguments about the rationale for the, um, adopting the five pillars of sustainable development, uh, and, and I'll proceed on that basis. Um, sustainable development takes into account, as we all know, the social, environmental and economic, which, in my view, fuses them into one and a way forward. Sustainable economic growth is, though, wrong-footed in this way. Further, sustainable has too many meanings attached to it when it is the precursor to economic growth. Does it mean that growth is sustainable, or does it mean an environmental or a social break on growth? Further, sustainable economic growth can entail ir irredeemable degradation of the planet, uh, increasing inequality and even arms production, and a poor diet leading to obesity. These are, these are bads which are defined uh, in this way. Economic growth, uh, sorry, this, this can be sustained for decades and decades, as we have seen, and significantly there, appear, significantly there appears to be confusion about what sustainable economic growth really means. There is a real concern in relation to the lack of clarity and policy definition in itself, which could cause confusion in the development of regulation as this government, as successive governments, act in a range of areas. Even worse, in the, marine, uh, in the draft marine plan, which was out to consultation at the moment we hear, and I quote, that the high-level marine objectives 
also reflect and incorporate the five guiding principles for sustainable development, which the Scottish Government acknowledges is an important element of increasing sustainable economic growth. So sustainable development now becomes a subset of sustainable economic growth in Scottish Government uh, policy. As we have heard, there are also concerns that lead to confusion for us, which may lead to the courts. As highlighted in evidence to the Rural Affairs Committee, Professor Colin Reid of Dundee University stated, it is unsatisfactory for legislation to impose a legal duty where there is so little clarity as to its meaning. What is clear is, and which I think we can all agree on, is that legislation must be robust and clear. And the recent Crofting Amendment Scotland Act has shown what can happen and is a salutary reminder for people uh, what can happen to people if it is not. In the words of the Law Society of Scotland's written submission to our committee, I quote, effective legislation is best made with precise terms. And I argue that the term sustainable economic growth is not clear and precise enough. Sustainable development is more likely to get it right as a holistic approach. And a range of stakeholders argue for sustainable development to be on the face of the bill. Scottish Environment Link is concerned by an economic, uh, and I quote, an economic growth duty for regulators because there is no legal definition of sustainable economic growth and therefore no assurance that it will align with the principles of sustainable development. And the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations highlights in its briefing, I quote, the importance of sustainable development was recognised in the passage of the Water Resources Scotland Act 2013 when it was amended at stage two in response to the EET Committee's recommendation to give equality of emphasis to all three pillars of sustainability rather than just the economic aspects. And indeed the National Performance Framework aims for a flourishing and prosperous Scotland through the balance of the 50 indicators, including biodiversity, carbon and equality issues. And as members know, there is now much work going on for the appropriateness of GDP, as, it, as uh, if, if this is right, as Scotland's only top-line measure of progress. Strangely, the two committees involved in the passage of the bill are unable to agree at stage one on this issue. And the lead EET committee, while it notes, I quote, the conflicting views, I can't take members the intervention, no, I'm minute. sorry. Uh, while it notes the convicting views of stakeholders only ask that sustainable economic growth is, I quote, explicitly stated and explained in the subsequent guidance, but not on the face of the bill. I, don't, I do not believe that this is good enough. However, the secondary committee, my own committee, expresses concerns in its report to the lead committee. I quote, we agree with stakeholders that if such a duty, sustainable economic growth, is to be included in the bill, then to ensure clarity and to safeguard against any reinterpretation of its meaning at a later date, a definition of the term should be included on the face of the bill. And finally, presiding officer, the committee remains unclear as to why the term sustainable economic growth is used in the bill rather than sustainable development on the grounds that while neither has statutory definition, sustainable development has international recognition and is understood legally across a number of regimes and jurisdictions. The committee recommends the Scottish Government bring forward amendments to the bill at stage two to include the definition of sustainable development in section 38 of the bill. I whole wholeheartedly support this approach. Many thanks. Now call on Bruce Crawford to be followed by Alison Johnson. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. You know, the, what, what, whatever our differences this afternoon, I hope today we can agree about the need um, an emphasis in the bill on assisting business in Scotland and to creating an environment in which business can flourish, while at the same time recognising that we need to offer protection to people and the natural environment in which they live. And today I want to discuss a particular case in my own constituency that is presenting considerable challenges to a number of my constituents, a situation that has arisen through no fault of their own, where the current regulatory framework does nothing to ease their plight. Um, however, firstly, this bill is an opportunity to look afresh at the regulatory framework and currently we and, and, and identify ways in which to improve it. For instance, by making legislation that promotes better consistency of approach across the country, thus assisting business in understanding what standards are expected, but while recognising that local circumstances still exist. I was taken by the Federation of Small Businesses MSP briefings mention 
made of pointless inconsistency. And I think that's actually what this bill is really about, that clearly causes frustration to businesses. And I hope this can be addressed by the bill's proposals, because it's a recurring theme for the businesses and individuals I speak to in my own constituency, particularly as regards actions around local authorities as well as organisations such as SEPA and SNH. Now, another key aspect of the bill we're considering is the environmental standards it encapsulates, and I very much welcome that thrust. And it's to an environmental matter in my own constituency of Stirling, where the regulatory reform bill has some potential to have major beneficial impact in some of my constituents. Let me explain what I mean by this. Around 18 months ago, I was contacted by constituents from Blainfield about a contaminated land issue in part of the village which had previously been built on the site of an old print works. The houses, which had been built in the 1930s, had been found to be situated in land which had been contaminated with high levels of lead and other hazardous substances. After testing and retesting, it resulted in 13 properties which are now in the need of remediation due to the level of contamination. The residents in Blainfield, along with Stirling Council, have come together to work to find the best possible solution to this matter. However, they are facing many obstacles. Firstly, the cost of remediation to Stirling Council and my constituents is extremely high, uh, partly due to the cost of landfill tax. Estimates suggest that the cost of clearing the, the land is likely to be over half a million pounds. Secondly, their mere concerns after remediation is that while the land may be made safe, their properties will still be listed on the contaminated land register. As it currently stands, if a local authority finds a site to be a significant threat to human health, it may issue a notice identifying the land as being contaminated, placing it on the contaminated land register. Even when the land is remediated and no longer meets the criteria of contaminated land, it still remains on the public record as the current legislation does not provide for a site to be taken off the register. Not only will they, to, will they have to endure the stress of their homes being on land which is contaminated, the cost financially of remediation and the upheaval during the clean-up process, but then once the land is made safe, their properties remain on the contaminated land register. This is something you might imagine is causing my constituents a great deal of unease, but this bill provides an opportunity to alleviate some of their anxieties. Now, I have been in correspondence with the Minister uh, for Environment and Climate Change about this matter. Uh, the, minister, the Minister was able to inform me the Scottish Government's intent in the bill to give local authorities the power to declare that land they had previously identified as contaminated is no longer contaminated and need no longer be on the register. However, closer examination of the bill's provisions in this regard suggests that further clarification is required. I say this because it has been pointed out to me by Stirling Council officials that the SPICE briefing paper on the bill states in regard to section 34, section 34 relates to contaminated land and special sites and, and amends the Environmental Protection Act of 1990 by proposing the following provisions. Enabling the local authority or SEPA to remove from a register of contaminated land a notice designating a special site if it considers that the land in question should no longer be specified as such. However, this provision appears to, re to relate to designated special sites only. And in the SPICE briefing, it describes a special site as follows. This is a specific designation for land where, for example, oil has been extracted, purified or refined, or explosives processed or manufactured. There does not appear to be a provision which would allow the land that could be determined as contaminated land on the former Blainfield Princeworks site to be removed from the register once it is remediated. I think providing this example, as I have done today, on behalf of my constituents in Blainfield, and I have no doubt other affected communities in Scotland, demonstrates an area where ordinary individuals' lives could be improved by the provisions of this legislation. And I look forward to hearing from the Scottish Government's response, either today or certainly before stage two, where I need to consider bringing forward amendments if required. Uh, but in the meantime, I fully support the intent behind the bill to bring a better regulatory framework into being in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Alison Johnston, after which we will move to closing speeches. Six minutes, please. 
Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you too to the witnesses who have given valuable input to this bill and to the sterling work of the clerks who, as always, have enabled us to scrutinise this legislation and bring it to stage one today. I dissented from the committee's recommendations to the Parliament that this bill be passed, and I'll argue why I believe changes should be made. The Regulatory Reform Bill introduces a new duty for regulators in Section 4. The regulators named in, in Schedule 1, like local authorities and the food standards agencies, must, if this bill is passed, contribute to achieving sustainable economic growth when carrying out their regulatory functions, except to the extent that it would be inconsistent with the exercise of those functions to do so. This hands regulators a conflicted remit. We're asking regulators that while doing their main job, they should focus on another job, unless that other job distracts them from their main job. As confusing duties go, this one is up there with the worst. I would suggest that in a world of limited resources, focusing on another outcome will inevitably reduce your ability to deliver your primary purpose. Certainly. Minister. I'm grateful to Alison Johnson for taking an intervention. I think, uh, I hope I made clear uh, in the earlier statement, this is not a case of distraction. It's a case where there's a conflict. Indeed, the Minister for Enterprise and Energy and Tourism made the same point. If there's a, a conflict in carrying out the sustainable economic growth functions in terms of their primary objective, then they're, they're not required to do so. So if their primary objective is environmental protection, that is only right and proper they prioritise. Alison that. Johnson. Minister, um, the, the Minister for Economy, Energy and Tourism, um, giving evidence to the committee, suggested that that wasn't the case. But it's OK for ministers to say one thing, but what is written in law will become law. I really do believe that in Scotland we should be passing legislation that is clear, focused and gives both our public bodies and businesses clarity about what's expected of them. And it's not good enough to argue that the courts can decide in cases of doubt. The FSB's briefing for today says 51% of their members found the most challenging aspects of regulations were interpreting which apply to their business. This duty makes the picture no clearer for them and it has the potential to make it less clear what the role of the regulator is. Regulators help stop the tiny minority of people who may cheat or deceive, gaining an economic advantage over businesses who are playing by the rules. This is how regulators help our economy operate smoothly. They enable a fair competitive environment for business to develop and they should be allowed to focus on their main purpose. Unison reported that many of their members were concerned that the duty will leave their decisions open to a range of challenges when they give priority to ensuring public safety over that of the environment. The Law Society said it would make it less easy for the regulator to make a clear-cut decision. The Law Society also questioned our ability to actually enforce such a duty and suggested it may just add further complication to process. Andrew Fraser from North Ayrshire Council thought the duty will end up as a lawyer's charter. The bill will allow, and the government plans, to produce guidance and a code of practice to, among other things, help regulators interpret what the economic duty means for them. I welcome the role the committee will play in considering the code, but the primary problem still remains that the duty in primary legislation risks diluting the main role of regulators and risks skewing decision-making, instead of promoting a balanced consideration of economic, social and environmental priorities. Regulators like SNH already have a challenging enough time protecting our environment. Let me be clear, nobody wants regulators to act in inefficient or overly complicated ways and unnecessarily interfere with business, but they must be able to focus on their job. I have yet to see convincing evidence that there is a major problem here requiring regulation. Regulators are willingly engaged with the regulatory review group and good progress is being made in non-legislative ways. Why add complications with unnecessary legislation and new duties when collaborative initiatives are working? The definition of sustainable economic growth, as we've heard, received a lot of attention from witnesses and the committee. This is quite right. The phrase has never appeared in primary legislation before. This bill is a first and it should be closely scrutinised. I don't have strong views on where and if any definition is spelt out. The real question for me is whether it's the right duty to be placing on regulators in the first place. During scrutiny, it became clear that the duty would play havoc with decisions made in the land use planning system. Under current legislation, as I've mentioned, a golf course took precedent over a site of such special scientific interest that an eminent scientist described it as Scotland's equivalent 
to the Amazon. I welcome Minister's intentions to lodge an amendment to exclude a local authority's planning functions at stage two, as I could only imagine what kind of decisions could arise if a duty to promote sustainable economic growth impacted on planning decisions. To me, the EET committee report on the subject reads like a cogent argument against any economic duty, but the conclusions agreed by majority vote don't follow. There was significant witness concern, both during the bill's consultation and stage one scrutiny, that the duty would skew decision-making. Many suggested the duty should refer to sustainable development. This is a term well understood. It has international currency. It is already embedded in Scots law. It explicitly balances economic, social and environmental issues. And I do hope the Minister will explain why this concept in law was not used instead. It is the government's right to focus policy on a single purpose, even if some of us question the concept, but there is a difference between the government's policy and what the parliament should write into law. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, that then brings us to the closing speeches. I remind members that all members should be in the chamber for closing speeches if they've participated in a debate. And I note that Margaret McDougall is uh, not in the chamber at the moment. I call on Jamie McGregor. Six minutes, Mr McGregor. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to close today's debate for the Scottish Conservatives, and I too thank those organisations that have provided briefings for today, and indeed those who took part in the various consultations. And I commend the Economy, Ed Energy and Tourism Committee, ably led by my friend Murdo Fraser, on a thorough Stage 1 report. I also welcome the work undertaken by the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee as secondary committee in relation to part two of the bill. And there have been some good speeches from across the chamber and a good deal of consensus today. Gavin Brown set out the Scottish Conservative position in his opening speech, and I want to pick up on some of the issues that have emerged in the debate. I think there's been a general degree of agreement that the Scottish Government's five principles of better regulation, namely that it should be transparent, accountable, proportionate, consistent, and targeted where needed are sensible and appropriate. There's also been recognition of the need to ensure that while regulation protects Scotland's built and natural environment, that these are key assets for our country and vital for our economy and well-being. It does so without placing undue burdens on business and helps support economic growth. We all recognize that this is a balancing act and a challenging one. And the volume, type, and cost of regulation is a big issue for businesses across Scotland, especially the small and medium-sized enterprises, including many uh, in my region, the Highlands and Islands, who often raise the matter with me. The Federation of Small Businesses said last year that around 30% of their members cited regulation as the biggest barrier to growth, with 62% of their members reporting the costs of complying with regulation have increased over the past four years. CBI Scotland has said, red tape is a significant and avoidable constraint on business investment and growth. So policymakers need to address this. In terms of part two of the bill, I welcome the proposals to update the role of SEPA as our environmental regulator and the fact that SEPA's objectives will include helping to achieve sustainable growth. Um, we all need growth. Uh, and I was pleased to note that SEPA, in its submission to the Rural Affairs Committee, stated it, it is committed to continuing to engage more with business and ensuring that environmental regulation is not unnecessarily burdensome on businesses, which I have to say uh, it has been in the past in many cases. CBI Scotland has been positive about the progress SEPA has made in these regards, and so I hope this can continue. In part three of the bill, section 40, I welcome the proposal for one appeal system for offshore marine energy projects. On section 41, the linking of planning fees to performance. I note that this was one of the most frequently answered of all the consultation questions. We support the government's aim of seeking to eliminate undue delay in the planning system and are supportive of the linking of planning fees to performance, as this should incentivize planning authorities. Now, we're aware of concerns about how planning authority performance will be measured, and we look forward to seeing the guidance of this from the Scottish government. And we would also agree with representatives from the business sector that they should be able to expect an improvement in, in performance from increase in the planning fees. 
Uh, in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, uh, the Scottish Conservatives support the consolidation and streamlining of regulation at every level, wherever that is possible. The Minister for the Environment will know that my crofting constituents, who, many of whom I visited uh, last weekend on Sky, would dearly love to see this applied to some of the legislation which is engulfing their sector. And some of these issues are, of course, being considered by the crofting law group's SUMP. Well, we want regulation that is concise, precise, easy to understand, and transparent. And we look forward to this bill helping to achieve that aim, and we'll look to ministers to further improve the proposed legislation at stages two and three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jenny Mara with around seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I began this debate today talking about the importance of regulation to our communities and to our environment, because regulations keep us safe and they contribute to sustainability. They make the everyday easier. And for regulatory reform to work, it must be built, yes, by government, but also by the communities that benefit directly from it. But with this legislation as it stands, I fear we will lose the democratic element to our regulation, lose the input of the people who represent closest to them, and therefore risk suffering from regulation that works against our local communities and businesses and not with and for them. And I completely agree with what Bruce Crawford said, that regulation is about creating the conditions for business to flourish while protecting people. I completely agree with that assertion as the Minister challenged me on at the start of debate today. We want to see the ideal conditions for business, but it is that balance that Bruce Crawford talked about, and I don't think this bill goes to the heart of striking that balance properly. I'm not opposed to national standards, but this bill must do the responsible thing and tell us unequivocally how national standards will work with our local authorities, whose duty it is to serve the needs of the community. The principles in a memorandum of understanding offer small comfort compared to the clarity of the law. But I fear that the government aren't prepared to clarify their law because they do not yet know the impact of the changes that they are proposing. And what good is a duty to promote sustainable economic growth to a regulator whose function it is to penalise businesses when they flout environmental standards? How will that balance be struck? Who will make that decision? The experts, the Law Society of Scotland, who's the Law Society's regulator and members representative are telling us it might be the courts which are overburdened already. Yet we are being asked to take comfort in a code of practice that has not yet been thought of. I would ask the ministers to, to seriously consider this. The cart is before the horse. All we really know is that the power will be coming to Edinburgh but not how it will be used. This bill will give the government the power to introduce, amend and delete regulations without proper oversight of Parliament. It's the stuff, I think, of a government more concerned about where power lies rather than how that power is used. And that's not why we fought for this Parliament. But I would ask and urge the Scottish Government this afternoon to seriously consider the remarks of the Law Society with regard to Section 4 of this Bill, the, respect, the regulator's duty in respect of sustainable economic growth. Because that guidance that the Minister, that Fergus Ewing was relying on earlier in his contribution, I don't think has yet been thought of, has been drafted. And it would be that guidance that the lawyers would refer to in deciding these cases. I, I think it's worthwhile reiterating some of the concerns of the Law Society. In their evidence, they have said regarding this duty. The underlying question in relation to the avoidance of burdens on commerce must be whether the imposition of this new duty actually contributes to better regulation or merely adds a further complication to process. If the duty is imposed, 
The failure to write it into decisions, difficult as it is to apply, may only result in generating a further ground for appeal of the decision. I would very much like the Minister, in his closing remarks, to address this concern around Section 4 of the Bill. Concerns have been voiced from across the Chamber today. Um, it is going to cross, cause problems in local authorities and, and in the courts, and I would really ask the Government to review this uh, before Stage 2. I want to see better regulation for Scotland. But I don't believe this bill guarantees it in any way. And my colleague Claudia Beamish made a good case for sustainable development being on the face of the bill. And I think this was also echoed, um, a case made eloquently by Alison Johnson. And I would ask the Scottish Government to make that one of their considerations also. The principle behind this bill, and I think the content, I think we've made our views clear, are currently unsupportable. But I hope the government are listening carefully this afternoon and may come back with some proposals. Yes. Gavin Brown. The committee conclude, recommended to Parliament that the general principles of the bill be agreed. Half the Labour members on that committee voted against it. Half the Labour members on the committee voted in favour of it. Can the member explain that? Jenny Mara. That is exactly correct. And I'm... I'm clarifying our position today that the general principles of this bill are unsupportable. I hope the government listen carefully to these considerations and come back with some proposals that we can find that we can support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Fergus Ewing to wind up the debate, Minister, around 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by, by thanking all members for the contributions to the debate this afternoon. I think uh, uh, I'd like to begin by uh, paying tribute to Murdo Fraser, as convener of the committee, for the way he's uh, 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 presented the arguments this morning, and to give thanks to the clerks of the committee, who, uh, are, as always, perform a, a power of work in the background to assist members in their scrutiny of the bill. We've had a useful debate this afternoon. Uh, Presiding officer, I can't say any of it has been desperately surprising because it rehearses and rehashes arguments that have been uh, put at quite some length, I think, at, on committee and perhaps proved to, to a greater extent on committee as is appropriate, as is possible, given the committee's procedure. Um, and I'll, I'll cover, I think, I hope, most of the points that were raised in the debate uh, today. But as always, I'm happy to correspond to any members, should I fail in this relatively short contribution to deal with any significant point. Um, better regulation is uh, an important example of our determination to use every available lever to support sustainable economic growth and make Scotland a more successful country, presiding officer, with opportunities for all to flourish. And the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill is a key element of our ongoing work to deliver better regulation. As Jamie uh, McGregor just stated, better regulation should be characterised by a number of principles, uh, transparency, accountability, uh, being proportionate, consistent and targeted. And these are principles that have been expounded and developed by the work of Professor Russell Griggs under the regulatory reform uh, group, whose recommendations are always worthy of very careful scrutiny by members of this parliament and have helped us enormously in a great many areas of the economic and environmental life of the country. This bill will help deliver a favourable business environment in which companies uh, and uh, small businesses can grow and flourish and successful businesses create wealth and jobs and successful businesses improve communities and ordinary people's lives. Uh, uh, and uh, I was delighted at the support that the business community in Scotland has evinced for this bill. And much reference has been made to the Federation of Small Business, which I think have taken a particular interest of this bill. And they start off their contribution, presiding officer, by, not by talking about business and economic growth and jobs, but by saying we know that regulation is necessary to protect communities and the environment from potential harm. We know that it protects small business employees and the public from the irresponsible and unscrupulous practices of a minority. So that's the beginning of their comments. That's the preface to their comments. 
Uh, and th that is extremely welcome. We are for better regulation. We're not for removing all regulation. It was regulation, presiding officer, that meant that uh, children no longer were, were put down mines or up chimneys. It was regulation, and this parliament has seen a lot of it, that's helped to deal with some of the horrific illnesses and problems associated with illness from asbestos. Mm. It's regulation that uh, has seen the regime in health and safety and our oil and gas regime being regarded as, a, a, as an example to other countries throughout the world. So regulation is not per se wrong. Regulation per se is necessary, but it must be the best regulation and it must conform to the principles that we describe. So laws and regulations play an absolutely essential role in fostering a prosperous, fair and safe society. And they provide essential rights and protections for citizens, consumers, workers, businesses, communities and the environment. In so doing, they also support sustainable economic growth. Uh, but as ever, we are ambitious for Scotland and we want better regulation, better in concept and better in development. Now, I'm delighted, uh, presiding officer, to have worked uh, along with the Scottish Government officials to whom much credit is due uh, with our key stakeholders, uh, especially with uh, COSLA. And I mentioned Stephen Hagan and those who are working with him in COSLA. And we have, I think, spent quite a lot of time trying to reach a modus operandi with which COSLA and local authorities in Scotland can broadly feel comfortable. Uh, I believe that we are on course to achieving that, but that work will, of course, continue. Indeed, we have also, and Paul Wheelhouse has been leading this aspect of the work, being closely engaging with SIPA and SNH in relation to their role. And uh, Mr. Wheelhouse, in his opening remarks, I think covered that uh, very clearly and, uh, in relation to the provisions on this bill. So I'm delighted that the bill reflects the views and the active input of the key stakeholders. And I, mean, I think really to suggest that it doesn't is somewhat unfair to all of those who've been involved in this uh, serious work. But I would also say that the committee's consideration of the bill uh, will enhance this bill and we will be bringing forward a number of amendments based on their recommendations. So we listen very carefully to what the committee say as is right and proper. Um, uh, I'm delighted too that Mr. Wheelhouse will bring forward uh, uh, amendments designed to protect uh, a, those who are working for SIPA against assaults and attacks on them in the course of their employment. Now, this was covered by Graham Day in his contribution very clearly. And this protection will be extended, as Mr. Wheelhouse clearly indicated, to those employees who you know, faced this type of threat in their work just in the same way as we have already extended such protection to other emergency services workers. And I say this in all sense of inquisitiveness, that if any member votes against this bill today and were it to fall, were it to go no further, then one effect would be, and this is really for, I think, the members of the Labour Party to consider, is that this protection could not be extended to the workers of SEPA. So were the Labour Party members, as appears to have been indicated, to be divided, uh, as opposed to in the committee, when uh, they appear to be split down the middle, uh, and vote against the principles of this bill, rather than try to amend it and improve it and deal with the points that were made by Claudia Beamish and others, then this would have the effect of denying to the SEPA employees the very protection that I would have expected Labour members to wish to extend. So perhaps they will reconsider even at this late stage. Now, I want to turn to perhaps the main point which I think Jenny Mara, to be fair to her, and Alison Johnson and several other members have expressed in relation to the, uh, the matter of uh, economic growth. We've made it absolutely clear, and I think the committee has recognised this and acknowledged it, that, uh, the, uh, that the duty uh, in respect of uh, sustainable economic growth uh, will be clearly set out in a strategic code of practice. I, I also recall that uh, when on committee we did allude to the fact that uh, John Swinney has already provided, if you like, uh, uh, a definition uh, a, of uh, sustainable economic growth, and he has done so in written PQS4W10994. Now, that doesn't mean that the Code of Practice will necessarily duplicate that definition, but I think to suggest that there is no definition 
uh, means that perhaps a little bit more attention needs to be given to what we have already said to, in the course of this Parliament and what has been responded by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance in the course of uh, answering parliamentary questions as is right and proper. Having listened to businesses, presiding officer, and with the endorsement of local authorities, we are also minded to bring forward amendments to introduce a framework for primary authority in Scotland, which will deliver consistent regulation through partnership working with uh, local authorities and a more supportive business environment through consistent, effective and efficient regulation will also be provided through other specific measures in the bill which will cover the integrated framework for environment regulation, linking planning fees to satisfactory performance of planning authorities, speeding up the process of resolving legal challenges to offshore marine energy projects and introducing a transferable certificate of compliance for mobile food businesses applying for street traders' licences. Uh, uh, and incidentally, that matter was originally raised by a member of the CBI at a meeting that I had with them a couple of years ago. And I hope that that shows that this uh, government is ready to, and actually does in practice, respond to matters, appropriate matters, matters that require consideration, which are raised by businesses, by organisations such as the FSB, uh, the CBI, the SCDI, the Chambers of Commerce, the Institute of Directors, and of course the trade uh, representative organisations. I'd also like to, to thank those representatives of the STUC with whom I've engaged. I think it's fair to say that we have not reached a total agreement on matters, but of course we continue to engage regularly and very seriously with the STUC in these matters as well, presiding officer. In conclusion, I am determined that uh, we will promote in all Scottish regulators a broad and deep alignment with the Government's purpose to focus government and public services on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth. I believe that Parliament shares that ambition, as indeed do regulators and business. We will therefore continue with a Team Scotland approach, working with regulators, business and others to deliver sustainable economic growth for Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes the debate on stage one of the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of motion number 6623 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill. And I call on John Swinney to move the motion. Uh, move formally, President Officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question on that motion will be put at decision time. And that brings us to the next item of business, and I will allow a few moments for members to change places. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 8254 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Dundee City of Culture. Could I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you have eight minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, I'd like to start by offering my congratulations to Dundee on being shortlisted to become 2017 UK City of Culture. I know the bid has been a collaborative approach with contributions and support of a range of individuals and organisations who have helped put together such a strong bid for Dundee and for Scotland. I pay tribute to the bid team, uh, some of whom are in the public gallery today, but I also wish to recognise that it is the involvement of Dundonians, the embracing of culture by the entire city that makes Dundee's bid so special. 
I'm sure members will agree that if given the opportunity, Dundee would showcase the 2017 City of Culture programme to the world. And this is clearly demonstrated by cross-party support across the chamber uh, with Dundee's bid uh, document. I'm very pleased to have that and see that uh, cross-party support. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I'd like to reiterate my full support and backing for Dundee's bid. The timing for this debate is opportune too, with the bid team making their final presentation in the current UK City of Culture, Derry, London Derry, later this week, alongside Swansea Bay, Leicester and Hull, as they bid to become the 2017 City of Culture. Earlier this month, I recorded a message of support for Dundee at the Hannah McClure Gallery, which exhibits the work of artists and designers working with digital media. The gallery also hosts events to celebrate and showcase Dundee's diverse local culture, with an exhibition programme that brings new and exciting work to a local and international audience. It was a fitting venue too, as the curator of the gallery is also the creator of the Neon Festival, Scotland's only digital arts festival, which was taking place that week in Dundee. And it, it perfectly encapsulates the real connections and flourishing partnerships that are the very essence of Dundee's bid. Dundee's website, We Dundee, has helped people connect uh, to the bid, allowing them to help shape and be involved in the bid. And the website shows the tremendous imagination and enthusiasm people have exhibited on what becoming City of Culture 2017 would mean to them individually and as a city. And if you haven't seen the website, I recommend that you do. Uh, Dundee's bid is based on the strength of the creative and culture sectors of the city. The bid is focused on the vision of encouraging discovery, regeneration and transformation. It intends to deliver a robust legacy which will build youth and community engagement through cultural activities. And the bid signature events will attract international audiences and a series of major events throughout the year will build on the city's existing programme of mini festivals and events and will be based on Dundee's strongest characteristics as chosen by Dundonians, the river, the light, the people and the environment. Dundee City Council has taken a lead in using culture and creativity to help tackle wider social issues in a range of innovative ways, with a strong track record of embedding culture into Dundee and further afield. And the further positive impact on regeneration that the City of Culture would bring would be a fitting legacy for Dundee as they continue to use culture and creativity as a catalyst to promote regeneration, an area the City have been pioneers in. 2017 City of Culture status offers a potential tipping point, a chance for the city to use culture to power the momentum of regeneration that has been growing in recent years. And the redevelopment of the waterfront in reconnecting uh, Dundee city centre to the River Tay. In the last two decades, Dundee has invested significantly in culture and creativity as its future direction. The famous Royal Research Ship Discovery, uh, Robert Falcon Scott's Antarctic Exploration Vessel, which was built in Dundee, is back home and berthed in the city harbour, providing an inspirational focus. Culture and creativity is at the heart of developments in Dundee, which is developing and delivering a large £1 billion waterfront regeneration programme. And this includes the £45 million Victoria and Albert Dundee Museum, which will showcase Scottish contemporary design and international exhibitions to tell a fantastic story of Scotland's design history. And the foundations in Dundee are strong. From cartoon illustration, gaming, Ur Willie and Desperate Dan, to the Dundee Contemporary Arts, welcoming over 300,000 people each year to a diverse and challenging programme of visual art, cinema, workshops, education and research. Dundee has variety. Discovery, Scotland's international film festival for young audiences, has just celebrated its 10th anniversary. The Dundee Rep is a leading Scottish cultural institution comprising the only full-time repertory theatre company in the UK, Scotland's contemporary dance company, and a cutting-edge creative learning team. The Rep has consistently won awards and developed an international reputation for the breadth and quality of its work. Caird Hall is one of Scotland's most popular city centre conference and cultural venues, which played host to the finale of the BBC Scottish Proms in 2010 and 2011, and is used for a wide variety of classical and contemporary concerts, conferences, and other civic events. And the recently refurbished McManus, Dundee's Art Gallery and Museum, has won many accolades for its sensitive representation. 
and for the quality of its refurbishment. From exhibits relating to the life of early man in the area, stunning paintings and decorative art, through to artefacts from industries past and present. The city's collections, many of which are recognised as being of national significance, give an insight into Dundee and its people. And testament to that, following its reopening in 2011, more than 160,000 people now visit each year. And Dundee's vision is to use culture and creativity to help create a step change, to close the circle of opportunity, using City of Culture to help ensure more people attend cultural events and activities through celebrating and embracing the culture of the city and its people, making it highly relevant, inclusive and accessible. And there is a focus on engaging with those who are deprived, disadvantaged or disengaged through long-term projects based in each of the city's eight local communities, bringing together creative partners with host communities at the centre. This, for me, is the heart of the bid. People, communities, the recognition of the fundamental importance of culture to place and the profound impact that it has on our very quality of life. Dundee understand, as we do, that culture is pivotal to our well-being, and the bid says so much about the type of city it wants to be. I haven't yet cited the potential economic benefits which 2017 uh, UK City of Culture may bring. They are impressive. The key finding outlined that if Dundee were to be the City of Culture, then the city may benefit from tourist expenditure of up to £80 million and the creation of up to 1,000 full-time equivalent jobs. But it's not solely the economic benefits that I focus on, however. One of the benefits of culture is it invites us to reflect on who we are and gives us an understanding of what we can be and become as individuals, as a community, and in Dundee's case, as a city. That's what delights me about Dundee's bid. It is committed, it is bold, it is ambitious, and I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I now call on Jenny Mara with seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In Dundee, I would like to see urban meadows like the New York High Line, an old boat parade with lighting and music, sculptures of the Bruins characters throughout our city, the Tay Bridge lit at night, a massive river pageant on the Tay. Nobody can say that we Dundonians are not romantic, ambitious and jealously proud of our beautiful home. Because these are all suggestions for Dundee's 2017 City of Culture celebration. Suggestions that came from the people of Dundee using We Dundee, a new digital interactive community hub that allowed the team to pool together inspiration and ideas from all of our citizens. And I believe it to be a first in the United Kingdom. Everyone having their say on what they wanted Dundee to celebrate in 2017, a special year for them. A community bid with voices of Dundonians singing proudly for their city. Feats of engineering, computing, and a history of jute, weaving and spinning, hard work, shifting bobbins, coarse and fine. Our tough experience in the mills, in the factories, our stories, our struggles, all of these have let Dundee grasp and seize the cultural opportunities when they arrived back in our city when the RRS discovery sailed home in 1986. Because culture, music, art and drama are nothing without a story and a struggle. It is the art of making the everyday beautiful. And that is why our cultural renaissance has been so successful so inclusive and so pervasive throughout the city. Because our city is not a divided city when it comes to embracing culture. The music rings out from venues across the city. The art galleries are so successful, especially the newly refurbished McManus, as the Culture Secretary referred to. Our city is united in the love of our home city and the culture that it boasts. But, presiding officer, it is divided in our share of wealth and opportunities. And that is why the greatest challenge, I think, of the 2017 bid is to make this year of celebration reap benefits for all our communities. Our greatest challenge in Dundee is to create wealth and opportunity 
in our communities who suffer the blight of unemployment, drugs, shorter lives and the desolation that wreck the chance of dreams. And this is at the core of why Dundee is bidding for this important year, as the Culture Secretary said, because we know the transformative effects that culture can bring. And we have witnessed that transformation over the last 40 years, from a post-industrial city to an exciting hub of scientific research, life sciences, medicine, technology, computing, gaming, with some of the finest engineering minds in the world creating new companies, staying in the city to create opportunities. We witnessed the deluge of Dundonians into the Dundee Contemporary Arts Centre when Donald Dewar opened its doors in 1999. We remember the fun of Dundee 800, the community spirit of witch's blood, and we know that with a well thought out, as our bid is, and well funded plan for 2017, that City of Culture for Dundee will make a difference to the lives of so many of our citizens. It will raise again our aspirations. It will give us memories, shared and individual, of the beautiful every day, centred around our prized v &A on the waterfront. And that is why I'm delighted that we have cross-party support across this Parliament this evening for the Scottish Government's motion. The Scottish Government has clearly indicated the unequivocal support of the First Minister, the Scottish Government and its agencies, standing full square behind this bid, because that is what we need to win. Our competitors are fierce, with similar aspirations, and rightly so, for their communities. Our bid for Dundee here in Scotland needs the unequivocal commitment at all levels of government to make this a success for Dundee and for the whole of Scotland. And that's why I'm delighted that the Culture Secretary has given this commitment tonight. Mm -hmm. And we will vote with pride and hope for the government's motion at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Liz Smith, six minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, can I say straight away that uh, the Scottish Conservatives are very pleased indeed to put on record uh, their very strong support for Dundee in its bid to become the UK's City of Culture 2017 and to complement the work of the Dundee Partnership, which put together the Tipping Point document. It's a, a very impressive appeal, not just because of the quality of the submission, but because I think it has successfully brought together uh, so many people within the city and within the local community, uh, just as the Cabinet Secretary has said. The local media teams and uh, the Courier newspaper, I think, are to be warmly congratulated for the positive coverage which they have both given to the campaign and also for the public support which they have helped uh, to generate, including supporting the ambassadors who represent Dundee's many faces and who share a passion and pride in the city. Uh, I don't think there can be any doubt at all about the extraordinary uh, transformation which is taking place within the city of Dundee. I remember as a very young child uh, the visits to my parents of one of my mother's uh, best friends who was also an international uh, opera singer and who was Dundee born and bred. And I remember the occasion uh, when she told my mother with great sadness that she would be uh, moving away from Dundee very reluctantly but it was the advice given to her by her musical colleagues in those days because Dundee didn't do culture. Well, how different she would find things today in a Dundee that is very vibrant with cultural development in theatre, in art, in dance and music, and where there is very extensive regeneration of industry and commerce. And she would also see the huge success stories of the universities of Dundee, Abertay and St Andrews in the hinterland of the uh, Tayside College sector, uh, which has allowed the area to build such a strong international reputation and play a leading role in the education of young people and uh, raising their aspirations. It was, of course, in the 1970s, as we mentioned already, that tough times hit the city uh, very hard, uh, most especially with the decline of the uh, jute industry. Dundee struggled then to compete with the other Scottish cities and it became uh, only too well known for its social and economic problems rather than for anything else. And it was at that time, uh, Jenny Marra mentioned the RS uh, discovery, it was at that time uh, 
uh, that the ship was very nearly sent to the breakers yard but for the intervention of the Maritime Trust. Uh, and just like the city, the ship had obviously enjoyed a glorious past, most especially when it was the focal point for the British expeditions to the Antarctica, including the first successful expedition for Robert Falcon Scott and uh, Ernest Shackleton. And it had been used by the Hudson Bay Company in the 1914-18 war effort, and indeed, I think, carrying supplies for the White Russians in 1917. But as she became increasingly outclassed by other merchant ships, her future became very uncertain, just as did the city of Dundee. But now, of course, there's a complete transformation. Discovery has won numerous awards for its museum and visitor centre and is very much on the international map. One city, many discoveries, I think, is a phrase that is very well chosen. And hopefully it will uh, act as a good luck charm uh, for next week when the all-important decision is made. So what have been the reasons for Dundee's resurgence? Well, probably the fact that on top of the very significant developments that took place some 30, 40 years ago in terms of the building of Nine Wells Hospital, Wellgate Shopping Centre and the RRS uh, discovery coming back, there has been the inspiration that has allowed Dundee to lead the international field when it comes to biomedical research, the gaming industry and the extraordinary uh, 40 million uh, V&A waterfront development the Cabinet Secretary has referred to. There are many who say that it is down to the sheer resilience of the people uh, of Dundee and the ability of the city to rise to new challenges that will really make the difference. Undoubtedly, the recent economic diversity, rather than the dependence on just a few industries, has been a very large part of the success. And if we look to uh, cities like Liverpool, uh, especially as the example of the 2009 European City of Culture, one of the very necessary ingredients uh, for that was that diversity of economic uh, development. And I think with that development and the regeneration uh, comes a newfound confidence uh, and the inspiration that social regeneration can come about by the celebration of our culture. And I don't think we should underestimate uh, the effect uh, that that can have. Now, the bid team has decided uh, to combine the celebration of the river and the Dundee environment with a celebration of the rich diversity of its people and how this unique combination can shed light on the pathway for future generations. I find that perhaps one of the most powerful aspects of the bid. I'm very pleased to see that within that, the commitment uh, to young people, to raising attainment across uh, the city and uh, to those in the underrepresented communities who can so often lose out. As the bid team has said very clearly, it's your city, your culture and your year, whoever you may be. Uh, success, Deputy Presiding Officers, in competitions like this depends so much on good preparation, just as we found out when Perth was seeking its city status. I am sure the bids from Leicester, from Swansea and Hull will be very tough opposition, but I am also very sure that we can be confident that the Dundee bid is both well prepared and a very passionate claim for recognition as the 2017 UK City of Culture. So may I wish everyone the very best of luck. Thank you very much. We have a little bit of time in hand for this debate. And so I now call on Alison McInnes with six minutes. Thank you. Well, as a regional member for the North East, it is a privilege to represent the city of Dundee. It has been quite remarkable to witness the journey the city has been on. And the sense of determination amongst its people to bring about change is totally admirable. I, I can remember many years ago, while still an Aberdeenshire councillor, visiting the city on a planning study tour to look at the importance of public open space and public art in urban regeneration. Now, what the City Council was doing then was, was quite small scale compared to the regeneration we're witnessing today. But it carried the hallmarks of creativity, imagination and determination that has propelled Dundee forward to this important tipping point. And what a regeneration there has been. The City's distinctive approach, firstly recognising that a cultural renaissance could be a powerful catalyst for change, and then successfully harnessing that cultural energy makes Dundee a very special place. And the UK City of Culture team has already recognised that by shortleting the city. Feedback at the time of the shortleting said that the bid was particularly strong in the way in which it talked about the journey of the city over the last 10 years. Using culture to regenerate the city was the DCA, the McManus, the Rep, and now, of course, the fabulous V&A. 
The judges were positive about the consultation and they were particularly impressed on the way the team engaged with people through the We Dundee website and, and um, Jenny Marr has spoken about that, as well as a number of people, of course, who have been involved. Council members, universities, community and cultural groups, young and old people, businesses and local media have all pulled together to make the best possible case for Dundee. My Liberal Democrat colleague, Councillor Fraser McPherson, and Dundee told me recently that the all party working together to positively support Dundee's bid has been the best example of cooperation between politicians of all political hues in many a year, and I echo that. Dundee would be an outstanding choice for the accolade of UK City of Culture, and I fervently hope that it is successful. There's nothing superficial about the bid. It addresses the real needs of Dundee, not shying away from the stark facts like the fact that a third of the city's population live in the areas which make up the poorest 15% in Scotland, not ignoring the fact that Dundee's educational outcomes are poorer than the Scottish average, nor glossing over the fact that the current level of participation in cultural activity in Dundee is divided between the poorer and the better off areas. No, Dundee's bid is about social regeneration through culture. And the step change will be to use culture and creativity to evolve a more confident community and through this to address these inequalities. Dundee will use the year of culture to connect parts of the city more effectively, ensuring those who live in its deprived communities are able to fully enjoy the benefits of its creative and cultural resources. And that would be a truly lasting legacy and something we should want to endorse. Let me turn now to the wider impact, and I believe that there will be significant benefits for the whole region of the North East. At the core of the economic impact is the increased visitor spend and the uplift in economic activity related to cultural-led tourism. Visit Scotland has recognised that the North East underperforms at the moment and that Dundee has a key role as a city at the centre of a region of great natural beauty. The visitor impact on Dundee would be to increase by 50% of the total number of visitors during the year of culture and to have a sustained level of higher visitors beyond that. The combination of completing the V&A, developing new hotel opportunities and improving transport links will place Dundee in a great position, for example, to attract cruise ships as well as UK-based tourists. Dundee, one city, many discoveries. All of us here tonight can praise this very vibrant city, but truth be told, there are still too few Scots and indeed visitors from further afield who have yet to visit Dundee and find out for themselves what's there to be discovered. I hope that the City of Culture bid will encourage a great many more people to come on their own visit of discovery. It's probably also worth congratulating the Evening Telegraph tonight for its campaign. Um, reading some of the online comments about what people love about their city was, was very uplifting. But there was one comment that just summed it up for me, and I, I quote, Dundee people are proud of a city which has seen hard times, but is reinventing itself as a modern city which embraces change and new opportunities. I have no doubt that this should be Dundee's moment. Many thanks, and I now call on Jean Arkett, who can also have up to six minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, on behalf of the Independent and the Green Group in the Scottish Parliament, I'd like to echo the support from across the Chamber for Dundee, Dundee's City of Culture bid. <clears throat> Dundee is, in many ways, a microcosm of Scotland. It's a city with a proud industrial heritage that is reinventing itself for the 21st century and leading the way in video games technology and bio biomedical research. It has been infused over the years with Irish, Italian, Polish, Asian and Chinese immigrants, to name a few. Ms Arkut, sorry, would you be able to move your microphone around slightly? Thank you very much. OK, is that better? Um, with both of its top-class universities continuing to attract students from all over the globe, the continued investment by the Scottish Government in Dundee's waterfront will also transform the way that its citizens interact with the city and will hopefully add further architectural excellence to Dundee's many cultural accomplishments. I'm assured by my Dundonian researcher that its football teams, uh, of which I personally know absolutely nothing, I may say, 
particularly those who play in dark blue, are also worthy of mention for their European heritage and exciting style of play. What really makes Dundee worthy of its bid, though, is its people and how they have shaped their sense of self through the bid. Artists and writers now thriving in a city universally recognised as bursting with opportunity and ambition. From Sheena Wellington's show-stopping performance of A Man's A Man For All That at the opening of this parliament in 1999 to the wry observations and brilliant talent of the much-missed Michael Mara. Dundee's contribution to Scotland's traditional and contemporary folk scene is legendary. Its links to Deacon Blue, Snow Patrol, The View and annual Blues Bonanza demonstrate that musical legacy continues to the present day. New publishing firms such as Teckel Books and the success of the Bob Servant novels perfectly encapsulate the irreverent Dundonian sense of humour. These success stories beget popular events with the DCA's Dundead Horror Festival and the Dundee Literary Festival, other highlights of a packed cultural calendar. This award, presiding officer, gives Dundee an opportunity to celebrate all her heroes. There are too many other cultural strings to Dundee's bow to mention. The McManus Galleries, the impending V&A Museum, DC Thompson, Brian Cox, A.L. Kennedy, William McGonagall. I could go on. But it's worth noting in particular the ongoing success of Dundee Contemporary Arts and the Dundee Repertory Company, not least because both were established at a time when some would have suggested arts funding as being a lower priority for the city. As two key drivers of Dundee's continued, continued regeneration, I believe they have demonstrated the intrinsic work of cultural, worth of cultural investment and they are two potent symbols of the dedication of the city of Dundee to its artistic community. And of course their success is because they're used, and they're used well by the folk of Dundee. So Dundee fully deserves this award. And I hope that when the judges take in the spectacular view as their train travels over the Silvery Tay, they realise that they have just arrived in a city of great culture in any year. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And I now call on Fiona Hislop to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until 4.59 to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for everyone for the contributions and also the, to the Parliament to, to enable us to have this debate this week, uh, which I think is a very important week in terms of the bid preparation and the bid delivery itself. This is a very exciting opportunity for Dundee and for Scotland to promote our cultural and creative talent to showcase our inspiring buildings and, and places to the world. And the aspiration of Dundee's bid shine with my vision for a Scotland which promotes Scotland's talent both at home and to the world. And the timing is right. The city of Discovery Dundee is on a journey where the potential is unrivalled and it deserves the opportunity to demonstrate the creativity and cultural heartbeat of what Dundee has to offer. Alison Johnson in her speech did talk about that journey uh, very well and I think in terms of reflecting on where Dun Dundee has been and is going, the opportunity and the timing um, of the, the City of Culture bid I think is at the correct moment for them to grasp and to succeed. The recently announced programme of Focus Years uh, include 2016, the Year of Innovation, uh, Architecture and Design, and 2017, the Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology. And this would all help in the lead-up to 2017, uh, particularly because of the strengths and talent that Dundee has in this area. And of course, the, the bid brings a wealth of opportunities to align and boost relevant activity with a view to focusing on visitors across the globe who are keen to learn more about this country's rich history, architecture, architecture, heritage and culture. And it's very important, and I can reflect on my visit to uh, Derry London Derry to hear and see about their year of City of Culture. It's not just what happens in the year. The lead up to the year itself is really important. So those sh showcase focus years will also be of benefit in the lead up to 2017. Uh, I also want to reflect on the partnership referred to by a, a, a number of people, including Liz Smith. The partnership that you see in Dundee, not just in this area, but generally, is something to be congratulated. I know Joe Fitzpatrick as a, and Shona Robinson as a local MSP are passionate in their advocacy 
of Dundee, but they also reflect what I think is an important USP of Dundee, is the fact that we can bring together the council, the universities, media, business, and that is something I think other cities could probably take, uh, take a lesson from. But it's also, I think, been one of the catalysts to make this bid especially strong. And I think uh, Alison Johnson was also correct in identifying the impact in the wider area. In, uh, sorry? Also, oh, Alison McInnes, sorry, uh, Alison McInnes was very correct in, in identifying the benefits to the wider northeast area in terms of also uh, looking at other areas. Angus Perth will also benefit from this, and I think she's right in looking at the potential that needs to be realised, both in tourism terms, um, for that area. Cabinet so Secretary, can I stop you for a moment? There's a bit too much noise in the chamber. Could we show some respect, please, for the Cabinet Secretary's closing speech? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. This is about respect for Dundee, actually, so hopefully everybody will get behind the vote uh, when we come to decision time uh, later on. It's entirely right that this debate today, the Parliament has recognised the contribution that Dundee makes to the rich quality and cultural offering we have in Scotland and that we have outlined clearly our support for the bid to become 2017 City of Culture. Dundee, as we've heard, lives and breathes culture and creativity. Last year alone, over 2,400,000 people attended cultural venues in the city and over 280,000 people attended festivals. And a bid centred around discovery, regeneration and transformation would be an ideal demonstrator city of culture, showing how these things can be done and done well in a city facing and overcoming challenges. And Jenny Meyer was quite right to talk about the challenges that the city faces, but the opportunity that culture has to tackle those. And I think in those themes, discovery, regeneration and transformation, the bid is very, very strong indeed. In terms of transformation, physically, uh, before your eyes, the city is transforming itself. But what the City of Culture bid does allow is that spiritual uh, change and that cultural change that can be, I think, the heartbeat of the city going forward. It's not just about the physical aspects, it's about the cultural aspects. So as a Scottish Cultural Secretary, I am excited and I am enthusiastic in supporting the Dundee bid. Uh, I think that support is uh, exhibited across the chamber and recognising 2017 City of Culture would perfectly encapsulate the philosophy and build further on the, the Derry, London Derry uh, City of Culture and the successes that they've had this year. Dundee's bid, bid provides an opportunity for culture and creativity to help bring people of all ages and backgrounds together from communities across Scotland, the UK and further afield. It, it, pre it presents an unrivalled opportunity to help widen access and participation and to raise the quality and diversity of our cultural offerings across communities in Dundee. Dundee is a, a city which is proud and is confident, rooted in culture and heritage, a city which not only cherishes its diverse heritage and traditions, but also continually seeks to create further opportunities to share and to celebrate. I hope to see Dundee designated the 2017 City of Culture. I'm delighted that across the Chamber, on a cross-party basis, we can come together to back the Dundee bid. Good luck, Dundee. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on Dundee City of Culture, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of motion number 8265 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on the Water Bill UK legislation. And I call on Margaret Burgess to move the motion. Minister? Removed. Many thanks. Uh, the question on that motion will be put at decision time to which we now move. And there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first question is that motion 8240, in the name of Fergus Ewing, on the regulatory reform Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should please cast their votes now. Thank you. 
The result of the vote on motion number 8240 in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 74, no, 35. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The second question is that motion number 6623 in the name of John Swinney on the financial reg resolution for the Regulatory Reform Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 6623 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 74, no, zero. There were 35 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. And the next question is that motion 8254, order please, in the name of Fiona Hislop on Dundee, City of Culture, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The fourth question is that motion 8265 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on the Water Bill UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament, uh, the motion is therefore agreed to and that concludes decision time. We will now move to members' business and I would be grateful if members who are leaving the chamber could do so quietly please. <laughs>